डॉक्टर श्रीनिवास चलो स्टार्ट यस सर यस सर सो वेलकम एवरीवन एंड रिस्पेक्टेड डॉक्टर्स वेलकम फ्रॉम ट्रांसलोमिना uh i would like to thank on behalf of the of trans entire transformation team for your valuable time and your uh, interesting presentations as well as your experience sharing with us today uh, during this session when going get tough stuff gets going so this session uh, the dr shrinivas uh, uh, like to introduce dr shrinivas kumar uh, he is a senior interventional cardiologist at uh, apollo hospitals hyderabad and sir has done a lot of uh, uh, many uh, complex uh, complex pci procedures including the tower procedures and uh, the other uh, complex pci's using our uh, ivl and uh, the, he is a, a leading international cardiologist in in his field uh, in in the in the entire state so uh, sir uh, uh, to to begin this session i would like to and over uh, the responsibility to you as a moderator sir and dr manoj s will be joining another 5 minutes so maybe we can start with the second presentation by dr rohit uh, so yeah welcome uh, welcome uh, everyone uh, to this, afternoon, uh, this afternoon session and uh, uh, congratulations and uh, all the best for the transluminar for getting making this possible in, even in this tough times so i think i am joined by professor bali and dr arun and uh, rk jani d is there as a chief for chairing this session welcome you all sir and uh, uh, as i already told we'll start with the second case and uh, i think manoj will join back and uh, start, present his case and uh, before we start uh, any any few comments from chairperson sir or shall we go for the case well, i think we go ahead uh, if that's okay with okay. dr bali okay yeah. thank you vijay and over to you for uh, uh, taking on to the next case presentation thank you so much sir so i would like to request dr manoj uh, dr rohit manoj uh, yeah yes can you hear me yes sir you are audible yeah, yeah. yeah okay okay i will go ahead yes, thank you so much sir Okay. Can you see my screen? Is my screen visible? Yes, yes, yes. Sir. visible, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Transluminia and organizers of this meeting for uh, giving this opportunity. I will share one case uh, where uh, the open NC was extremely useful. in treating this patient he is a 77 year old male a known a diabetic hypertension cad had and got cabg as well as pci and now present with unstable angina uh, echo was fairly okay left system had uh, isr but uh, limoto led was patent and you can see this l6 also is fairly decent low with no significant uh, narrowing is right here don't go on pci into the outside hospital where they had put a stent in, uh, two stents in the rca and you can see there is some stenosis in the mid part of here and this cell uh, stent probably was under deployed uh into the distal part of the rc and hence he developed a uh, risinosis we thought this is the significant uh, stenosis and this could be uh, responsible for his angina you can see from here so we took him for uh, uh, pci to right coronary artery after wiring uh, and femoral approach and the wiring we uh, did a normal balloon and followed by an uh, normal did not give the way so we used a non compliant balloon 2.5 mm and you can see that it it's not giving away the waste so you can see the significant uh, midline middle part of the balloon of waste was there 
even though as i said we attempted uh, scope like balloon not sure it was a vice versa or not but then it, it also didn't uh, work we before we realized that it did not work we thought that scope like was balloon has done fairly really good job as uh, can be here and we put a uh, sincero stand uh, there uh, then we little re realized that actually the scope like had not opened the lesion and you can there is a significant uh, stenosis is there and the mid part of the stand did not expand well so here come we thought we'll uh, open up as a normal practice uh, with a uh, non compliant balloon 2.7510 it uh, it unfortunately did not give the way away you can see that uh, the it's just not giving the way so here comes then we use the open nc balloon 2.5 mm and then it uh, at a 40 atmosphere it gives the way and opens up the expands the stand which initially actually was originally uh, under deployed you can see the that this that part of the stand after this is clearly open up uh, well thank uh, so it has been more than 2 years uh, since the procedure and he's been perfectly fine no uh, significant angina although, although i haven't done any check and so it, this is the first time i had used two years back open nc which bailed me out of the thing uh, from this so there are now we have multiple technologies we can use lithotripsy we can use open nc you can use rota so a lot of such things are available then this was extremely useful after this i have also used about five cases in open nc and it has bailed me out uh, very well i personally don't have any experience with lithotripsy but we will learn to see them thank you very much for your kind attention thank you dr uh, manoj uh, thanks for showing an interesting case <clears throat> how bed preparation uh, will be helpful in these patients uh, though inadvertently we tend to think that uh, using a smaller balloons and compliant balloons here you also tried non compliant balloon didn't open nowadays the stents are so good even if you make little uh, passage the stents should go and you land in some trouble like this where the stent is inflated and doesn't expand well you will be left with a significant under expanded portion of the stent and this is a place where i think opian balloon has helping us the most for us and without this sometimes we are at a loss now people are trying even ivl balloons uh, in this sort of things but uh, if you can always the message what we can take from this case is to always uh, prepare the bed well so to avoid such sort of uh, troubles in our uh, think thinking that it is already open we tend to take the stent because the stent has passed uh, earlier generation it was not like that and then earlier generation stents never used to go if this lesion is not prepared the later generation stent one advantage is that so thin struts it goes even with minimal opening sometimes the nc balloon does not go but stents go we have seen such instances also it was very important for us to prepare the bed well and uh, this is the main usage of opian balloon i think for the sake of others uh, many of them are worried with so high pressures whether it patients tolerate i think what we need to keep is uh, the size under control the don't take a bigger size balloon here i think you have taken 2.5 uh, nc yeah 2.5 yeah, yeah so yeah. Though, though vessel was about 3 uh, plus then he has taken 2.5 <clears throat> then there is no worry of rupture so high pressures uh, can take um, uh, make the stent expand well and uh, yeah, the in deflators of which comes with this also is different and probably we need to have that in lab uh, normally sometimes they kept a opian balloon sometimes uh, the type of in deflators were not available so that is also a problem we need to have the balloon as well as the proper in deflator which are to be used and that's how the stent is expanded well then probably the results would be better if you significantly like uh, uh, earlier stent stenting procedure is stent stent, stent was under expanded obviously they were likely to come back with restenosis i think uh, that is very important message if the bed preparation if the bed is not prepared well and stent is taken you land in trouble and in under expansion again leads to uh, patient coming back with symptoms and restenosis all these messages we can learn from this case thanks for showing this and the greatest strength of surgeon again is a left side lima to led works well that's what uh, will happen time and again we keep seeing this thanks for showing this case and Thank any you. comments from uh, bali sir and chopla sir i think uh, you made uh, all the point and uh, professor rohit's case was very great my only uh, one suggestion is that once we go at 48 mass with 2.5 mm and break the 
waist, then we again need to go with the optimum size and see balloon to optimize to the size three millimeter or whatever. But I think great case and uh, it undershows that uh, long term complications are much higher. It's trying to suboptimally deploy. Wonderful case. See, uh, I have one comment to make. The thing is that uh, uh, the operator was lucky in this case that they were uh, able to open this tent with the opium balloon because uh, your options, you have lots of options once uh, till you have not deployed this tent. Once you have deployed this tent, your options are very much limited. What would have happened if, you know, your opium balloon had not, uh, you know, been able to open the struts well, then your options are really limited. So the important message, as has been uh, told earlier, is you should not take this tent unless your bed is really well prepared. Otherwise, you will land up in trouble. We had one case where, you know, we ultimately did not, were not able to open with even opiate balloon. And uh, ultimately, patient had to undergo urgent bypass surgery because after that, he started developing uh, uh, ventricular and uh, so this the message is you should prepare the bed only then take this tent that's all yeah, your point is well taken that's what i was trying to tell but this is a little unusual dr vimal the patient uh, stent under expanded immediately it may not produce that uh, worry to take the patient for cabj i'm not advocating it should be left like that but yeah, some, yeah. some suppose you in the process of taking and expanding the multiple things either a clot developing or the dissections happening proximal or distal then the patient would go into uh, like requiring for surgery, urgent revascularization, things like that. But per se, that little underexpanded portion, fortunately, in the calcific lesions, chronic lesions, uh, uh, there will be less requirement of surgery. In your place, patient which has required surgery, there could have been some other lesion, uh, some other problem which could have developed in the process of uh, expansion of this tent. Maybe uh, I'm just telling these uh, chronic uh, cases, especially calcific lesions, some, some, that way we are fortunate. We do a lot of things, but patients are very tolerant, unlike ACS type of patients. In this chronic or little under expansion, also stations immediately tolerates. He'll come back with angina later. That is different. Yeah, that's so, true. But it's very, very less possible that he needs surgery in the same setting. But always uh, keep that in mind. What you said, your point is well taken. Bed preparation is absolutely essential. And uh, Dr. Rohit Manoj sir mentioned regarding the other modalities uh, which he has not used and things like that. All of us, I think he also knows it, but for sake of learning, and what I'm mentioning is this rotablation, lithotripsy, opian, balloon, and all these uh, gizmos, gadgets, which we have in tackling the calcific lesions. What we need to understand also is to use which type of uh, device for which type of calcification for a fair amount of, uh, just to uh, give an idea to listeners and other viewers and the seniors like Bali, others should excuse me. So basically, if it is uncrossable calcific lesions, then that's where you take the help of rotablation because obviously the balloons won't cross, nothing goes. So you take rotablation. And then if you are comfortable with this, uh, now the laser atherectomy devices have come. That also is helping in some patients. We have less experience with it. So that is about uh, almost occlusive and uh, where the balloons cannot cross. Then the next comes uh, with calcific lesion where uh, smaller balloons can go. You have pre prepared some uh, little space for NC balloons to go. This generally works for mild to moderate type of calciums where all these years we were just tackling them by, by taking care of NC balloons and expanding them. The problems come when the severest type of calciums, that's what it said that more than 180 degrees arc and more than 5 mm depth of calcium and more than 5 mm length, that's where we need to take uh, more aggressive uh, helps like uh, IVL balloon, uh, IVL uh, lithotripsy, which they have, and opium balloon. The How we decide generally is if the depth of calcium is more deeper, that's where I think uh, we take the help of IVL balloons because it's supposed to crack with deeper uh, levels. Whereas if it's suppose uh, it's not that deep, somewhere in mid-type of calcium, that's where opium balloons uh, could help. The cost difference is so much. That's why we always tend to take the help of opium before we decide on to go on to IVL and lithotripsy. But all these decisions can happen only after you do a proper imaging. Uh, so that's why I was requesting uh, translumina IVL people to package that with the imaging catheter so that uh, the, the procedure goes in a more systematic manner. I think that's for the learning. I just mentioned those. And if there are no further comments on this case, we'll go for the next presentation. Thank you. Vijay, you introduce the next one or shall I do it? Well, uh, who is the next uh, presenter? Dr. Dr. Ramesh uh, the, is the next presenter, sir. 
Okay. So, I would like to request Dr. Ramesh to uh, present your presentation. Thank you so much, sir. I think Vijay, you can keep helping us like that because some presenters are not there. You know it better than we, okay? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so am, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, good afternoon to all seniors and friends and uh, congratulations to BICA team for organizing such a nice meet in uh, the situation of pandemic. And uh, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, sir, uh, Rohit, sir. Because uh, sir is my teacher and uh, I have learned all things from him. Thank you, sir. Uh, to start with uh, my case, uh, this is a case of calcified and tortuous right coronary artery where we have done a PTCA with the help of shockwave lithotripsy. Uh, this patient came to us uh, last year with uh, 70, uh, he was a 76 year male and uh, came with uh, non acceleration MI. Initially, was an, he was in hypertension and he was a known case of coronary artery disease since last 10 years, but was, but was not undergoing any kind of intervention for his uh, obvious fear. He uh, was stabilized first and then uh, was taken for coronary angiography. His echocardiography was uh, uh, showing that uh, there was mild hypokinesia of right coronary artery territory. Ejection fraction was 50%. On angiography, it was a calcified triple vessel disease. We advised him for uh, for CABG, but again, for his obvious fear, he was not willing for uh, CABG. We gave uh, we gave him a second option of uh, a PTCA to right coronary artery and LAD, with the help of uh, shockwave lithotripsy, for the, which he agreed. So this is angiogram of that patient where uh, uh, we can appreciate there is a, a diffuse calcification in right coronary artery and there is a significantly tight lesion in middle of RCA and distal RCA at the uh, uh, before bifurcation. And uh, when we see a left coronary system, uh, there is a plucking in left min. And again, there is a diffuse calcified proximal segment is a significantly tight lesion in uh, LAD. It is 85, uh, somewhere around 85% disease. Circumflex is non-dominant vessel. And uh, again, there is a proximally 95% disease and still it is diffusely calcified and diseased. We thought uh, we can offer him a uh, uh, short wave lithotripsy in this uh, situation and we can uh, treat him with uh, PTC to RC and LAD. To start this case, uh, we uh, took a femoral route and uh, we hooked the RCA with the help of seven French uh, AL guide. And to start with this case, uh, to start, we use a Shion black wire and uh, tried to negotiate it till the distal lesion, but uh, distal lesion was, we were unable to cross that, that distal lesion. So we switch it to the filter XTR wire and we were successful in crossing the distal lesion. Now, uh, well, while we, uh, we were uh, thinking of getting some support in this tortuous calcified vessel with the help of another wire, an un unfortunate event occurred in proximal RCA where we dissected with, uh, because of this AL guide and uh, the dissection spread till the uh, middle of RCA. Now, nothing was uh, crossing in the distal uh, uh, bed of RCA. Uh, even a small 1.25 balloon was not crossing. And despite having a seven French AL guide, we were uh, unable to push any kind of 1.25 balloon. We thought we can use anchor balloon technique and uh, while and we put an anchor balloon in RV branch and with the help of it, we pushed a small balloon in the distal uh, RCA and we dilated the distal and the middle lesion with the help of 1.25 balloon and sequentially dilated with 1.5 balloon, then later on 2 balloon and finally with 2.5 non-compliant balloon as well. At this time, uh, because uh, we were unable to uh, see the distal flow, uh, dis uh, flow in distal vessel, we thought we let's uh, why not to fix first dissection uh, in the proximal part of RCA. And we, after a proper dilating of the proximal part of RCA, we put a stand, uh, drug eluting stand over there. The and uh, again, then we thought to uh, take the IVL balloon in the middle part of uh, RCA, but it was not going. With, uh, or there was all type of resistance where, because of uh, heavy calcium in the middle part of RCA. So we take, we thought we, let's take help of Guidezilla and we tried to push it uh, through the uh, RCA. But again, the difficulty came and uh, here again, there was a difficulty that RCA, the, uh, the Guidezilla was not going beyond the middle of RCA. 
and uh, we again took an anchor balloon technique and uh, with the help of anchor balloon technique in the rca we pushed guidezilla till the middle of rca then we use ivl balloon and uh, we gave three uh, cycles of uh, uh, the sonic pressure waves and we successfully dilated the middle part of the lesion then uh, we uh, uh, put a, a drug eluting stent in the distal bed uh, distal rca and, uh, and another drug eluting stent in the middle part of rca with the help of guidezilla it was torturous it was difficult but we managed finally we post dilated this lesion with 2.75 balloon and uh, theo balloon these were the final result of uh, this uh, rca and uh, as you can uh, see the flow was uh, good timothy flow was there Uh, so in a similar way we did a ptc of uh, uh, led as well and uh, the result were beautiful this patient uh, developed uh, uh, issues after one month where uh, he developed covid 19 pneumonia and uh, though he got uh, well after that and uh, 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 without uh, getting admitted in hospital at the score of ct severity score of 11 and he is following us uh, since 7 8 months and he do, he is doing pretty good so my final take home messages are that uh, while uh, doing uh, complex ptc proper selection of guide and hardware is important and uh, these guide uh, guidezilla and guideliner can be very useful for delivering uh, these hardware in the distal part of tortuous uh, vessels shock wave lithotripsy is very useful in calcified arteries learning curve is uh, not that much uh, uh, bad uh, compared to a uh, rota ablation where a learning curve is required but sometimes there is difficulty in delivering them uh, uh, these uh, shock wave uh, balloon at the uh, legion sites and that that's where we need uh, help of uh, uh, the things like guidezilla guidezilla anchor anchor balloon thanks thank you dr amesh uh, for showing another calcific uh, triple vessel disease in elderly patient and uh, probably you decided rca because that was a culprit Uh, uh that was the culprit vessel and he had inferior volume i and you yourself mentioned that uh, amplers or guide could uh, create trouble that's what has happened and the proximal rc got dissected especially these calcific vessels when you are trying to get in out and the various types of balloons and things like that uh, that there's more chance of uh, amplers or guides uh, damaging the proximal rca once the proximal rca gets dissected and then probably then the problems increase because the flow distally also becomes less so another simpler way of uh, doing could be because the distal rca looked big uh, you done it like this but suppose the previously before the rca distally was occluded it was looking like pda also was reasonably big and then probably if you open up this side also it would have been simpler but because you felt that the distal rca is big that's why you attempted uh, to open up the distal vessel so to keep simple uh, uh, things simple probably one would also decide just to open that mid rca and come get it committed to the pda and the distal vessel could be filling from retrograde actually if you can do it like what you have shown simply easily that's best because you are doing the total revascularization even the distal rca is opened up and the pda is also opened well but if you expect that sort of troubles then proximal is rca dissected means that your entire rca could have been gone so luckily you could manage but always uh, in elderly people where especially in this uh, acs type of scenarios try to keep the procedure simple and uh, try to do a quick job and come out uh, lad1 uh, we have not seen but probably it was simpler lesion that's how you just predilated and uh, did that was uh, you did the lithotripsy to lad also the ivl balloon there also we did not we have not done uh, lithotripsy to lad it was uh, uh, we did it uh, with the, in a, in this uh, simple way uh, i think it opened up okay but the advantage only with this is you can as well use it for many pulses 80 times some of them could be delivered there also if there's a calcific led lesion i think it was not there luckily i think a patient did well but these view points which you have mentioned are well taken the amplers are guide using itself uh, like should be a last resort because uh, this tends to injure the proximal rcs especially when you're getting in and out and the wiring what you used initially some other wire you said cyan blue or something later on you changed to fielder xt fielder xt wires are very useful uh, wires especially when so called ctos about one third of them you can cross them with the fielder xt itself there will be faint tracks uh, in the like in this patient that how it slips down most of the times and uh, once we cross it then we tend to take a little more stabler wire more supportive wire 
by putting a micro catheter exchanging that field rexty wire then get back a more supportive iron man type of wire this could have helped in this sort of difficult scenarios we have a calcific lesions and uh, i saw that uh, field rexty wire continuously being there so that doesn't give much of support that is very good to cross but later on if you support take a bigger good supportive wire like iron man and grand slam it would have helped you in tracking ivl balloon we need to understand though it's good to expand but it also needs uh, it is slightly bulkier than regular balloons we need to have a, a good support for it to go in and uh, i think those are some of the learning points which i wanted to share but uh, finally you saved the patient uh, you need to it deserve congratulations but in a, in a elderly people whenever especially with the inferior wall mi recent issues it is better to try to keep the procedure patient the procedure simple and uh, try to come out without much of complications i think those are my some of my comments i think um, that is very well taken and uh, dr shrinivas has already summarized all the relevant points i also agree keeping the procedure simple is a good idea and perhaps in this case once you had committed by taking uh, an amplards guide uh, i also agree that you should change over to an extra support wire fielder is a great wire great crossing wire but not a good uh, stent wire not a good hardware wire you have to change it to put the hardware in and probably that was the reason while you were trying to manipulate with the balloon and other stuff into the distal rca that's why probably in some such manipulation the guide catheter must have injured the rca ostium or the proximal part so maybe in such a case changing to an extra support guide wire and using uh, the guide zilla earlier may have helped because uh, it was a calcified rca taking in a guide zilla earlier with the help of a balloon a 2 mm balloon can help you negotiate the guide zilla down into the rca that might have made uh, life a bit easier for you ultimately of course a uh, uh, very good result and i think all the other relevant points have been already made so anybody else would like to add something i think uh, two points in addition to all the points have been made one uh, al7 french i don't uh, see why 7 french was chosen in the first place and when you you have to be very comfortable using al catheters because al has its own curve we have to maintain that curve and stay at the ostium once it deep throats that is when the problem starts uh, arising the other point is if you are using a al al 0.75 may be a good idea to use in right coronary where uh, ostium is a little uh, angulated which will give you a reasonably good score and uh, dr arun's point is wonderfully uh, well taken that you should have a low pressure of using any guide extension catheter because uh, instead of struggling with anchoring balloon and others over a reasonably stable guide by grand slam or iron man you, you can uh, with the help of a balloon go down with a guide liner and make the procedure simple uh, and intervention cardiology is the simpler you make better the result is and more enthusiastic you become over a period of time if it will make more complex takes more time is more um, uh, dangerous for the patient and it also dissuades you from taking complex cases so try to play with the straight bat that is the best way to go, go in intervention cardio Thanks. you need to become dr bali to make the procedure simpler as you keep becoming more senior then you devise methods to make the procedure simpler all of us learn from our experience but finally you save the patient other thing uh, uh, bali sir this wire not only of lesser support and things like that but it tends to do wire perforations also distally that is another headache with this filler type it is very slippery unless a second operator is controlling the wire It tends to go deep and then it also perforates there are some instances of wire perforations also there is another disadvantage this uh, filler xt type of wire excellent wire to cross many of the times it helps in tortuosity is very faint trickles but these are the limitations of that wire which you need to understand i, I think, think uh, which, well, another, another thing which we saw in this patient is very common with filler xt is in addition to causing perforation it coils on itself and the yeah. tip sense is lost and once that is lost then you have a problem recrossing it or something like that so i think that just use it for crossing that is all after that the earlier if you want to get with the parallel wire fine if you have any difficulty with the parallel wire go ahead with a uh, micro catheter and change it earlier we change all these uh, four, fine tip uh, wires the better it is yes they are not good for uh, completing the procedure but good for starting thank you Vijay, can you call the next presenter? I think I'm just yes, watching sir, the sir. time. Also, each of the presenter has to take uh, 
seven eight minutes and we should finish the two three minutes discussion each case for ten minutes is it so yes sir that's what uh, i see so in the dr. program okay right yes Go sir. Ahead. so dr manoj is with us now now that he has joined us uh, for this session so i'd like to request dr manoj dr manoj is a senior interventional cardiologist from haveri hospital chennai and he has done uh, a lot of complex pcis so we'll be sharing one of the complex pci procedure uh, presentation with us today over to you dr manoj yeah uh, thank you graph noon uh, i hope everybody has had a lunch and uh, sitting quite comfortably so that we can listen to more uh, important complex cases and uh, especially when the um, going gets tough so how to get going so thanks for the opportunity from the bic and also the esteemed chair moderator dr srinivas kumar uh, this is an elderly acs gentleman uh, who is a doctor who presented with acute flash pulmonary edema and he was noted to have a triple bifurcation in the left main circumflex and also led which was heavily calcified and was planned for a chip pci along with my co consultant dr anand raman presenting from kaveri uh, hospital chennai uh, once again 86 year old uh, gentleman who is a doctor uh, presenting with acute flash pulmonary edema with 28 years of diabetes non smoker hypertension stage 3 ckd baseline egfr of 51 old inferior wall mi about 12 years back noted to have a single vessel disease uh, of right coronary artery total occlusion on medical follow up this was done in usa where he was practicing and then came back and settled in india now present with the end stemi with the ejection fraction of 45% to 50% moderate to grade 2 am mitral regurgitation pulmonary artery hypertension with the moderate pulmonary artery hypertension with the pa pressure of around 48 inferior wall segments with scar anterior ivs and mid anterior wall segments were hypokinetic he was initially kept on medical management but they could not be discharged and he was containing continually experiencing recurrent rest angina with breathless, breathlessness and hypoxia extending his hospital stay rt pcr for covid 19 was not detected and uh, the coronary angiogram was done uh, which would be shared and a chip pci for led diagonal circumflex and om was planned so these are the images uh, you will see that uh, there is a very critical uh, left main ostium and also you will see a, a significantly critical uh, circumflex and uh, major om disease and uh, these are the images of the right coronary artery was totally occluded mid segment but it was well collateralizing from the uh, the pda was well collateralizing the led had a very densely calcified bifurcation and you also see the diagonal is equally the same vessel as size as the led but there is an aneurysm there with an undermined plug there which you would appreciate later on here also you would see that there is an undermined plug with a proximal aneurysm in the um a uh, diagonal so uh, these are the baseline uh, um circumflex ivs images in the mid circumflex you see a fiber calcified plug just beyond the om and this is uh, the proximal circumflex where it is a fiber calcified in between uh, there was a significant uh, um arc of calcium of almost uh, 270 degrees and this is this is the image at the circumflex ostium which was also significantly diseased you would see that uh significant plug burden at the circumflex ostium and this is the left main which again a uh, eccentric arc of uh, calcium and uh, significantly narrowed uh, ostium of the left main so this patient had a uh, circumflex uh, ivl balloon uh, after initial pre dilatation with a 2 mm 3 into 12 mm ivl balloon to the uh, circumflex across the om vessel and then the proximal circumflex and then we use the balloon at the left main ostium even though it's an uh, eccentric uh, calcific disease and the uh, uh, delivering the first cycle in the left main ostium the ivl shockwave balloon uh, burst away and uh, no further uh, shockwaves could be delivered there and this is the images after the shockwave uh, balloon uh, in the circumflex you would uh, appreciate that there is a significant uh, luminal gain is no uh, uh, dissection and the flow was good over the side uh, um, branch of the major om uh, is also pinched and uh, this patient uh, uh, initially was trying to uh, deliver the uh, after the shockwave balloon the des could not be delivered and uh, there was a significant obstruction to the left main ostium and uh, circumflex ostium and therefore uh, a wolverine balloon was used to uh, open up the circumflex ostium which was significantly narrowed and then you would see that uh, the the guide extension catheter 
one could deliver the drug eluting stand into the target vessel segment of mid to distal circumflex with three into 18, 28 mm DES, and followed by a, a magic touch balloon into the side arm across the stand into the uh, side branch, and final kissing balloon of the circumflex and OM. And then uh, port was done in the proximal of the mid circumflex. And then IVS uh, images was done. We didn't take much of check shots uh, because of uh, this underlying CKD and you would see that well optimal images. And this is at the side branch. You would see the side branch is well open. There is no pinching of the side branch uh, OM. And this is proximal to the OM vessel side branch. So all the optimal uh, the stent deployment was achieved. And then uh, we uh, went ahead with the, we went ahead with the LED and you would see that's a heavily calcified would not allow um, uh, 1.5 mm, 1.2 mm balloon or, or neither uh, 0.8, uh, uh, 1.0 uh, mm balloon could not cross the LED. And um, we did not have a 0.85 uh, Nick Nano at the beginning of the procedure. And by the time we finished the circumflex and used these three balloons in the um, LED, we got the 0.85 Nick Nano, which also did not cross. However, uh, despite that, um, there were no significant uh, um, issues to the flow. The flow was maintained. Patient was tolerating the hemodynamics quite well. And this is the Nick Nano balloon, which also did not cross the bifurcation there. You would see that uh, one minute. So, and then finally uh, dilated that segment with a, a 1.2 mm balloon wherever it reached there. And then um, there was no further progression of the um, LAD uh, complex PCI. So it was really going very tough and uh, I could not uh, proceed any further. So it was uh, a strictly a balloon non-crossable lesion. Um, let me go to the next slide, yeah. So it's approach to the balloon uncrossable lesion, you know, they use a small balloon, we have used multiple small balloons. The grenadoplasty uh, uh, can be used, but this patient had a, a mild aneurysm at the circumflex and at the bifurcation level, I didn't want to use the grenadoplasty because aneurysm always is a weak part of the vessel wall and increase the support. We had a good support with two guide wires and um, microcatheter was also used uh, in this patient initially for wiring the vessels and the wire cutting with both the vessels being wired, uh, there was a buddy wire outside the uh, 1.5 and all the balloons that we use. So finally we use this technique also. So what was left alone was to use an atherectomy and laser. And we would certainly know that uh, the atherectomy with uh, rotablation requires a change of balloon, change of guide wire. And it was very difficult to wiring. It took almost uh, 25 minutes to wire. So we chose to have a laser uh, a use and we certainly know that uncrossable lesions the laser is uh, one of the important indications using a 0.9 mm into 80 uh, catheter. And that will be compatible with a 6F guiding catheter of 0.9 mm. Uh, and you will see the differences between the excimer laser and rot rotablation. The guide wire can be the same routine coronary guide wire. You don't have to exchange and uh, use the guide wire. Whereas for rotational anatomy, you have to change the guide wire, particularly in this kind of uh, situation, I didn't want to change the guide wire uh, if there was no other choice. So we used uh, Excimer laser 0.9 uh, millimeters. So even if uh, uh, the laser does not cross, the lesion is si still significantly modified. So that's a uh, lesson, lesson that we have to uh, understand that uh, the laser catheter does not cross. The laser applied to the significant uh, plaque uh, is still modified and there's no need to change the wire. So this is the Excimer laser system in our cath lab. And you would see that uh, we used a 0.8 into uh, catheter at uh, 40 into 30 for artifluence in the 30 frequency, 45 into 45, 60 into 45, and maximum of 80 into 60. For almost 80 cycles of lacing was delivered with very minimal gain and advancement of the uh, catheter beyond a certain point. And even though there was initially two guide wires, we thought the significant uh, luminal restriction was preventing the advancement of the laser guide wire. So we removed the uh, side branch guide wire from the diagonal and uh, still there was no significant advancement of the ELCA guide wire, um, ELCA catheter from the proximal LED into the mid LED across the bifurcation. And these are the final images after the almost 45 minutes of uh, lacing uh, with multiple cycles uh, with this uh, guiding catheter and check shot did show that there was no further injury perforation 
or uh, a dissection in the uh, LAD and the branches of uh, mid LAD as well as the diagonal where flow was well maintained. Patient was not experiencing any kind of ischemia or hemodynamic uh, discomfort. So it was really getting tougher and tougher and we are left only with the option of rotational atherectomy, which we are strictly feared that we may have to change the uh, guide wire with a difficult wiring. And there's always a significant wire bias because of the eccentric calcification before the bifurcation. And you would certainly appreciate in the next, uh, um, uh, next frame that as I was removing the uh, guide wire from LED, you can see the uh, significant wire, uh, the plant bias was deflecting the microcatheter into the diagonal. So wiring that with this microcatheter was extremely difficult. However, it took another uh, 30 minutes or uh, 35 minutes to uh, wire using the guide catheter I mean, micro catheter with a rotty floppy guide wire. Finally, you could get a stable position after almost 45 minutes of wiring into the LED and then uh, used a 1.25 mm road ablation bar at 160,000 RPM. And uh, you would see there was a very difficult burring, long burring time, and you indeed needed a very sustained uh, uh, burring, uh, unlike the usual uh, picking motion. And you would see that there is a significant contact there at the bar here. And finally, we could achieve a, a cutting through of the um, significant eccentric plot into the mid LED after many, many cycles of burring. And this is the uh, check angio after the rotablation. Again, did not show any plaque uh, um, rupture or uh, uh, coronary perforation. The side branch was also well preserved. And then we did uh, IVL um, uh, intravascular ultrasound, uh, which uh, I suppose it should come, yeah. So the intravascular ultrasound showed a significant uh, circumferential calcification with um, significantly narrowed uh, lumen in the mid LED. And you see the reverberations of the circumferential calcification post ablation It's quite typical in uh, intravascular ultrasound. So subsequent to that, we used a 2.5 mm shock wave in the mid LED in the proximal LED. And then uh, you would see a significant luminal grain. What we see is a post rod ablation shockwave, almost a stent-like result in the proximal LED. The side branch is also flow, uh, flowing well, and the aneurysm is uh, remaining untouched. Uh, and uh, this is the 3 to 28 mm drug eluting stent from proximal LED to the mid LED across the bifurcation. And post uh, stenting, uh, you would see there was a very optimal stent expansion with no manner position, and there were neither distal dissections in the mid LED. And finally, a culotte stenting of uh, left main to circumflex, uh, left main to LED, uh, final kissing balloon, and a pot to the uh, left main with a um, 5 mm balloon was used. And these are the final images which I would leave you with, but the importantly, well optimized um, circumflex LED, Lemus, and uh, um, uh, left main bifurcation uh, optimal results. So, uh, next slide. You will see the still images uh, which shows the uh, very significantly optimized uh, luminal gain. The side branch is flowing normally. The aneurysm is left untouched, even though uh, we had in mind to uh, use a drug eluting balloon in the side branch. So heavily calcified, triple bifurcation, hostile left main, uh, critical uh, uh, chip PCI in an 86 year old uh, doctor, uh, uh, gentleman, chip tool uh, box uh, should be comprehensive enough to envisage all possible significant challenges that can be met with in a densely calcified a critical coronary artery disease in a complex patient like this, when the really gets go, the going gets tough, as in this chip case. This also case illustrates an appropriate utility of the newer technologies: intravascular lithotripsy, drug coated balloon, Wolverine cutting balloon, ELCA laser um, technology, and the image guided directional interventional therapies for ablation for a successful procedure. ELCA has a significant limitation in densely calcified long segment lesions. However, ELCA does modify the plot even if it failure to cross the lesion. Rotablation is indeed an effective tool in the chip toolkit for making way in a non-crossable lesions like demonstrated in this case. IVL is the most useful and user-friendly chip tool in many instances of uh, dense calcified plot. With the use of all these important tools, there was a successful outcome and uh, this doctor patient could be discharge for home four days after the procedure. However, what was lacking was, yes, uh, additional MCS support could have been uh, used and it would have been a welcome, but this patient uh, remained hemodynamically stable with a dwelling period of six hours, and we had a standby uh, MCS support available in our lab 
And thank you for your patient listening and allowing me to present this uh, wonderful case. Congratulations, Manoj, uh, for an excellent case presentation. I think just to present what all you did also takes 15 minutes. Imagine how much time you could have taken in cat lab. But uh, congratulations. I think it needs a lot of team effort and uh, everybody working together helps in dealing with uh, such difficult uh, uh, patients uh, which were uh, being rejected before. That sort of cheap cases, I think we were not able to treat them before and uh, now we are able to handle. I think practically you used up everything what is uh, described for calcific lesions, no? Like, uh, yeah, certainly, yeah. And the intention think, of uh, presenting is uh, yeah, that yeah. sometimes you may be stuck with these kind of cases and we may have to go through it. But rotablation finally helped to cross the lesions. But uh, laser would have been very useful in many situations. If it had crossed, that would have made the things much better. Manoj, I have a question for you. <clears throat> Did you plan the laser before? Like, uh, like the laser is available in your this thing, in your, in your setup? It is always available with us, yeah. That's why it was useful. Otherwise, I just would have gone directly to rota instead of laser. Yes. Exactly. Correct. Since it was available and we don't have to change the wire in this uh, elderly gentleman and difficult wiring um, since it was available on site, so we used it. Welcome, uh, uh, Dr. Jain. We yeah, yeah, hey, for hey. you. Yeah, the Manoj, one more thing. Uh, this patient actually had a the old, inferior and recent anterior. No, You had some sense of feeling that LED would be difficult. That's how we did LCX before, I think. Otherwise, we could have um, attempted uh, doing LED before because LED appeared as anterior my recent. That is a culprit, you think? Just uh, for yes, the... of course, the culprit is uh, LED, but uh, you know it was, there was not much of thrombus there. It was heavily calcified, and LED the circumflex uh, and the OM was much doable. So I want yeah. to reduce the myocardial burden before I yeah. treat the circumflex. I mean LED. Yeah, sir. Any thoughts, sir? The Bali sir and uh, my other co-chair. Uh, I think it was an excellent case. Uh, do it for it on. A uh, couple of observations. I think it couldn't have been done better, but just a couple of observations. The first instance when we used an IVF, we used an, a three millimeter IVF for left main, osteo, which I think would be an undersized and may not have done any, uh, it got uh, ruptured also. Uh, the second point is, although we saw the guideliner being used in the circumflex and neoplasty, so guideliner was able to be negotiated uh, without causing much of ischemia through the left main osteo. But we did not use the, uh, see the guideliner being used while crossing the balloon in the LED leak. Sometimes uh, no, you balloon did cross well. Yeah. Balloon crossed well, but the stent did not be delivered. So we opened the uh, left main ostium, and then uh, the left main ostium and circumflex uh, allowed no, the I'm, guide I'm, extension. I'm, I'm, I'm talking of the LED now. When the LED wire had crossed and you had a wire in uh, diagonal, uh, and the balloon was not crossing, your point eight uh, balloon was not crossing. I did not see a guideliner being used as that. Uh, yeah, that we didn't thing. use guideliner there. We didn't yeah. use a guideliner. No, we've seen many cases where you have a uh, heavily calcified lesion and you take the guideliner right up to the site of stenosis and you will find that the uh, balloon will slip. That is the other part. The third observation is that in the LED, you again use a 12.5 into 12 millimeter IVF when the vessel size would have been three. So any particular reason for uh, undersizing the IVL in the LED? Uh, the, the middle LED uh, at the bifurcation. The middle LED at the bifurcation and the tightest uh, site um, was around 2.5. So we referenced it for the middle LED and at the bifurcation site. Of course, approximately uh, LED was larger than that. So it was basically to modify the plaque at the site of Carina and middle LED, which was 2.5. So it was sized for that vessel. Excellent. I think it was more of a, a combination of calcium and the bends are there. That was yeah, creating that is, uh, more that is why I say that once uh, you lose the guideline, that yeah. bend uh, you know, is negotiated much better with this. Uh, I, have, I have one question. Uh, hello. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Please. Yeah. So is it possible that you can stage the procedure rather than performing uh, such a long procedure in an older gentleman? Because sometimes uh, performing so much of contrast load and uh, sometimes you can patient can have cardiac arrest also because there are so many hardwares and so many things have been used, such a long procedure. If you'd have tackled left main and LAD first and then stage the procedure after a few days for the circumflex, I think that would have been a better than rather than doing so long procedure on a, such an older person. The yeah, because the LCX was distal, and, uh, uh, if you do a left main, that's what he must have thought. Because 
to do it there you will be blocking the entry with the stent that's why you couldn't have done lcx om later but your point is well taken whenever it's possible it's open we can do once we are doing a pull out and all those yeah. things so we are your point is well taken whenever there is a possibility the... what you are trying to say is whenever there is a possibility try to stage rather than uh, continuously challenging the patient at the same time but if you can get away you tend to do it uh, like manoj uh, had a lot of expertise that's how we could get away but the main challenge here what we would have had is to put a stent we are not comfortable anyway though nowadays latest generation stents we could take through stent tracking and all that but sometimes it becomes difficult uh, the left main stent across lcx ostium working in distal lcx could become challenging and you could uh, you might need another some work uh, which has to be done again the proximal left main portion that's how i think uh, he has taken i think we have already crossed a lot of time for this case itself we'll go to the next case congratulations thank you, thank you. excellent case thank you yeah I would like to invite Dr. Rakesh Sapra. Uh, he is HOD cardiology from QRG Hospital, Paridabad. Sir, over to you, sir. Uh, please present your presentation. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, in fact, after having seen uh, Manoj's case, uh, I think every other case would look rather rather simple. Uh, but uh, this is a uh, but you know. It's very difficult in angioplasty to actually say which case is simple and when it is going to get tough. But um, I'll show a case which initially uh, looked rather simple, and then as we uh, went ahead and uh, did the case, uh, at every step we found uh, some new difficulty coming up. So this was a 80-year-old gentleman who was hypertensive and diabetic, uh, had uh, had uh, uh, bypass surgery done earlier, had pacemaker implantation, and uh, had angioplasty done to circumflex in obtuse marginal uh, uh, one year earlier to this presentation. And uh, on the uh, uh, just couple of months before this uh, uh, angioplasty, which was done, he had undergone angioplasty to LAD and diagonal at a different center. Uh, so now he presented to us with acute coronary syndrome. And when we did angiogram, we found uh, that he had a very uh, uh, critical lesion in obtuse marginal, which was an uh, instant lesion. And uh, uh, as you can appreciate, he has a long stent in LED going into the diagonal. In fact, there are two stents. So possibly uh, because of the complexity of uh, or uh, challenge that the uh, other operator might have faced in doing the LED lesion, he might have left uh, the circumflex lesion or maybe circumflex lesion uh, pro progressed because the gap between the two procedures was uh, actually uh, just two months. So this is a um, uh, audio cordial view. And here we can see um, uh, a tight lesion in the circumflex obtuse marginal, which is uh, uh, actually instant. There's a stent there. This is a AP cordial view showing the same thing. And uh, the initial thoughts after uh, uh, having seen this uh, uh, angiogram was, the challenges that we thought uh, could be because of the tortuosity that uh, is there in the circumflex. The obtuse marginal was arising at a 90 degree bend. So we thought there can be a challenge uh, there. And then the lesion was an uh, instant lesion. So we thought maybe that could be another challenge. So these were the few initial thoughts which came to our mind when we started up this case. But relatively, this case uh, appeared straightforward. And uh, we thought we'll go ahead and uh, uh, dilate and stent this. Lesion crossing was not difficult. We could uh, cross with the usual uh, uh, whisper wire. But uh, uh, when we uh, started or tried to cross uh, uh, with the balloon, the balloon actually got stuck uh, in the left main. So balloon could not enter the circumflex proximal portion itself. So the lesion and the bend and the obtuse marginal origin was much farther, but the balloon was getting stuck here. So this was a little unexpected. And uh, the initial thought that came was maybe uh, because of uh, poor guide support and because there's a similar 90 degree bend at the circumflex origin. So maybe uh, taking a buddy wire can help. So uh, we took a buddy wire. And, in, and uh, in fact, at that point of time, uh, having known that uh, uh, the LED stent was coming till the ostium, Another thought which came to our mind was that possibly that wire could have gone through a strut. So taking another wire uh, possibly uh, should help in that scenario. And it did help. We took another wire and uh, we took balloon on the second wire. And this balloon could travel down easily, relatively easily. And uh, we could predilate the uh, lesion of interest. 
but after having dilated when we uh, decided to take a stent the stent again faced the same problem the stent just did not enter the circumflex ostium and that was a time when we felt that no there's something uh, something is amiss in this region and then uh, we actually tried to take the stent oh, both the wires individually yeah, and stent to take negotiate so we uh, the moment, see hello so so we uh, decided to take a, to evaluate this uh, ostium of the cerc to see what exactly is troubling so we took a short balloon uh, across uh, and kept it across the circumflex ostium and uh, did a stent boost and when we did a stent boost it was uh, quite clear that both the wires were actually going through the strut of uh, led stent which was uh, crossing or almost almost completely covering the cerc ostium so it was more than 50% across the cerc ostium and we double checked it by uh, uh, doing a stent boost while keeping a wire inside the led and then we took a balloon inside the led and did a stent boost and we found that the uh, stent in the led was significantly across the cerc so it was obvious that uh, it will possibly not be uh, uh, possible to take the stent across unless until we deal with this problem and we open the strut there so so we decided to go ahead and uh, uh, open the strut in the uh, across the circumflex ostium so we we kept a balloon in the led and uh, took a balloon inside the cerc across from left main to cerc and we dilated this and did a gentle kissing also to prevent uh, any deformation in the led stent and after this we uh, decided to go ahead and stent the circumflex but again Uh, because of the uh, because we had predilated the ostium of the obtuse marginal we had to cover the lesion from circumflex into the obtuse marginal across the ostium of the obtuse marginal but this long stent again could not be negotiated because of the problem at the cerc ostium so we had to go ahead and stent by using two smaller stents so one stent was uh, used to uh, cover the culprit lesion and the second stent was used to cover the ostium of the obtuse marginal so from circumflex into the obtuse marginal so this till this uh, ask point uh, things were uh, still quite manageable and this is this is the second stent being deployed at the cerc ostium from uh, circum uh, at the om ostium from circumflex into the obtuse marginal and after this uh, we uh, uh, went ahead with the post dilatation we took a post dilatation balloon post dilated the Uh, culprit point in the obtuse marginal and then uh, we pull back uh, the uh, post dilating uh, uh, balloon to the ostium of that uh, uh, stent inside the cerc and did a stent boost and that was the time when we by doing while doing the stent boost we found another problem we actually found that uh, the portion of the stent in the led ostium was actually something like collapsing into the cerc ostium i mean although it's not uh, clearly visible in this stent boost i'll just show a line diagram to uh, depict what uh, we uh, we actually saw there so this this is something what was uh, we started off with so there was a stent in the led ostium which was uh, more than half covering the cerc ostium and our wire was repeatedly uh, going through the uh, stent strut we could not negotiate our wire uh, from this small gap here Uh, but after having stented the distal uh, the culprit lesion in the obtuse marginal and in the proximal part of cerc on stent boost this is something what we saw that the uh, stent in the ostium of the led was appearing to be collapsed or deformed and part of it was uh, uh, collapsing inside the ostium of the cerc so this metal was uh, metal was visible inside the uh, cerc ostium and a collapsed metal was uh, visible in the uh, ostium of the led so this is the place where we felt oh so this is something we uh, and maybe because of the um, repeated push or uh, uh, problem that we had in uh, taking uh, one long stent down and then we had to, to use two smaller stents maybe at that point of time the stent might have uh, captured some strut in the uh, led ostial stent and might have pulled it or deformed it towards the cerc ostium but after having seen this 
Now, it was obvious that we had to deal with the, this uh, bifurcation, this left wing bifurcation, had to, uh, in, in fact, reconstruct the Carina and uh, treat the uh, ostium of LED also and uh, cover this uh, ostium of circ also. So, uh, uh, but initially we uh, had a feeling that uh, let's try and compress the portion of the stent which was uh, prolapsing inside the circ ostium and we compressed with a balloon there. And uh, after having done that, in fact, the angiographically, the lesion appeared to have uh, been dilated and treated rather well. The circumflex ostium, the bend of the obtuse marginal and the culprit lesion in the obtuse marginal, all were treated well. Uh, the only problem that we felt as compared to the original uh, picture was that the ostium of the LED was appearing little narrower as compared to what we had started with. And uh, after having seen what we had seen on the boost, which we uh, double checked again by uh, having, by keeping a wire both in the LED and in the circ. So we kept the wire, took the wire inside the LED and did a stent boost. Again, we found the same thing that the, the ostium of the LED uh, stent was partially collapsed. And uh, by keeping a balloon across the circ ostium, the, the metal which was prolapsing in the circ ostium was still visible at the circ ostium, also, although angiographically, the ostium was appearing adequately expanded. So uh, looking at the overall picture, I mean, uh, definitely if, if I had IVAS at that point of time, uh, we possibly could have decided to leave it. But uh, from what we uh, saw on stent boost, I definitely felt uncomfortable to leave a collapsed or partially collapsed stent in the ostium of uh, LED and uh, a metal uh, 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 collapsed uh, portion of the stent in the ostium of the circ. So we decided to uh, stent both the ostium of the circ and the ostium of the LED. And we decided to do uh, with a V stenting uh, because we were working on a six French uh, uh, hardware, six French guide. Uh, so taking two stents together was uh, very difficult. So we decided to do it in a step fashion. So we took a stent across the circ ostium first, first keeping a balloon in the LED and we deployed this. And then we uh, took a stent in the LED ostium, keeping a balloon in the circ ostium, and we deployed uh, this uh, next. And after this, uh, we went ahead and did a uh, kissing uh, balloon, uh, uh, keeping a balloon in the LED ostium and the circ ostium, and we dilated uh, both simultaneously. And uh, we, and this is what uh, we finally got. Both the ostia were uh, very well dilated, and the LED ostium was also looking now much, much better. It was fully expanded as compared to what it was uh, looking earlier. And the uh, rest of the culprit lesion uh, obviously was uh, quite well uh, maintained. So uh, from this, uh, my take home message uh, is that whenever there's a previous stent at the ostium, possibility of a stent partially covering the other ostium should always be kept in mind. If the passage through the st struts can be avoided, definitely that is the ideal and it will definitely make the procedure much, much simpler. But as it was uh, not possible in our case, we had to go through the strut. So uh, we had to uh, make a passage by dilating the strut. And in such a scenario, possibility of stent deformation should be kept in mind, especially when the other stent has been deployed recently, because here the gap between the two procedure, which we checked later was just two months. So maybe at that point of time, the previous stent in the ostium of the LED had not completely endothelialized. That way, that's the reason why it possibly got deformed when we were opening the strut uh, across the circ ostium. And in our case, 10 boost uh, definitely came very, very handy, but the intravascular ultrasound would have been the best guide if it was available with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh sir, for uh, showing this uh, interesting case. And uh, as you yourself mentioned, uh, that the imaging would have helped us to understand the situation better and then avoid uh, further complications. But uh, short of it, because you didn't have maybe that's how stent boost uh, could help you proper some steps. And then uh, analyzing the previous uh, stenting uh, angiogram probably uh, would have been help, help, helpful to us. Sure, because sure. if you had felt that ostium proximal portion has come on to LCX, then you would have mentally prepared yourself to go rather than finding sudden um, uh, new things on the table. That's yeah, one. That's Second thing is after you did uh, the dilatation kissing then to take the stent, uh, it appeared that LED wire is removed in between. That is another yes. thing. I don't know why. Suppose LED wire was there always, this stent coming back into this vessel could never have happened. 
because the led wire always keeps it uh, properly opposed that side probably in a, i don't know why it was removed and it is never advisable to remove also now you would agree uh, by default it must some reason it must have been removed then if the wire was not there that's how when you pushed it the proximal portion came into the lcx maybe as what you have shown in the diagram but if the wire from left main to led was not removed there was less left chance of getting into that i think as a lesson we should never uh, remove the uh, wire because uh, if suppose the artery closes then you would have landed more trouble no fortunately it didn't happen i think that too could have avoided some of the troubles and uh, finally you did a v type of uh, pro procedure and uh, in that process we should also be careful not to injure the left main which you must have taken precautions and uh, some of these post cabg patients you must have had more experience sir whatever the some new funny heart becomes distorted you get into lot of troubles and though it looks simple the and one more thing is the om lesion though they are small focal they are always deceptive you tend to get into trouble unlike lrd and rca these are some of the thoughts for me and um, jain or the bali sir anything you want to say yeah i'll, I'll just first uh, clarify that yes uh, that uh, in the hindsight uh, taking that led wire definitely was a mistake i mean i mean i'm not sure whether keeping that led wire could have prevented the deformation but definitely that would have ensured that uh, my passage to led was always uh, ensured because i was lucky to uh, you know cross it uh, uh, easily later on and uh, finish the procedure uh, the way i did but uh, that could have been a challenge because after having that deformation in the stent in the uh, even wiring the led could 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 have been a messy affair so definitely uh, that point is very very well taken that uh, when we are doing and after having discovered that the strut is across it's covering that carina uh, keeping that wire in the led all the time would have been uh, definitely a must thing to do uh, dr kesh great uh, i have a suggestion to make to you i think your lab led stand which was into the uh, carina uh, crossing the ostium of the circumflex and into the left main was obviously not endothelized and was small in size for the left main so the wire which you have put in into the led uh, went through outside the studs and then entered the tubule and so when you did a kissing balloon at that time uh, initial part i'm talking about you actually uh, the stand got deformed the, the stand with using entirely into the circumflex ostium so this is being compressed from outside so that is uh, the issue i think your wire first time uh, was not into the led through the tube lumen it was from the outside left main through the studs and we have seen it happening in the new studs your balloon can go very nicely through the studs if they are not endothelized uh, in the new generation studs so i think the wire was from outside the left main into the tube lumen and that is why the led stand got uh, compressed your thoughts on that oh i agree sir uh, hi uh, rakesh hello hi, good afternoon uh, i think i agree with you sir uh, dr bali that this was my thought too that probably the led stent is undersized and when you were uh, negotiating the wire into the circumflex you possibly crossed from through the led studs you know from the sort of superior margin and that's why the whole stent got distorted when uh, you did the balloon dilatation later on so this could have accounted for uh, this sort of distortion no but these things these things are clear when you do stent boost if if my mm. wire into the circumflex was going through the superior margin that would right. be really visible in stent uh, uh, similarly okay. Okay. Similarly, okay. Similarly, i I, I, no, I, want to, no. i want to know your stent boost which you did the first time when you found that the wire was going through the studs yeah and yeah. stent boost which you did the second time When yeah, I mean, well, yeah. we actually because first time, we, first time you did not detect that the left LED stand was distorted form. You only found that the wire was going through the studs. And the next time when you did a stand boost, you found that the LED stand was deformed. So therefore, that compression which has taken place by the balloon has deformed the LED stand. Am I, I think that's right. I think that is the only proper way that uh, it would have got deformed so much, sir. Just by pushing the entire stand. It yeah. won't come down into this. I think the balloon must have caused that problem. I think. Uh, yeah, you that, have the picture of both the stand boosts. Uh, which yeah, I have picture. I'm, I have oh, picture. I think first stand, uh, stand boost and the second stand boost. But yeah, I, I think. Uh, Srinivas, can I make a small comment, uh, Srinivas? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, it was a nice case that he finally tackled. But one of the ways of uh, wiring the circumflex when there's a stent floating from LED across the carina into the left main and circumflex is to occlude the. uh led stand with a small balloon so that the wire doesn't cross tall so you use stent boost to 
upload the stand uh, at the proximal end and uh, then wire the circumflex. So it'll, there's no cause of uh, it getting through the stand. And then get the uh, guide liner into the circumflex and finish the rest of the procedure so that every time you exchange this wire is well secured and uh, you are certain and guaranteed that the wire does not cross through the stand steps. But anyway, he had to work on the proximal LCX again because the lesion was there. You, you have to. Then subsequently, you can do any of the uh, uh, techniques of bifurcation. Yeah. But another think... idea. Another idea here is um, when you found uh, that the wire was through the strut, uh, you could uh, take a, a micro catheter there. Then you could, uh, you know, use another wire with a micro catheter. Make sure that you are outside the stent struts while crossing. And then it makes the whole procedure simpler. The second thing I thought was, you know, that V-stenting is not a great idea here. You ultimately had a very good result, so I think it's uh, fine. But uh, V-stenting, you know, invariably leads to some injury to the left main. That's what I mentioned and, initially. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, you did. And uh, think... see, if there is stent thrombosis, it's somehow extremely difficult to recross a stent which is occluded at the ostium if it's a V-stent. There is some problem with the, you know, the inter uh, mingling of the struts. And since you had a six French guide and you use two separate stents, again, the chance of missing something is there. I would have uh, much preferred if you had used one of the standard bifurcation techniques. I think uh, putting stent from uh, LM to LCX would have been better in this case. It would have converted uh, this procedure into something called the older generation classical crush, uh, where the almost 50% of the strength strut of, from the LAD it is projecting into half of the STL ostium, which is already co compressed. So it would have converted into classical crush, uh, which would have been, uh, which would have protected LM and LCX also. I, mean, I think the I best mean, would have been uh, leaving anything and just leaving I mean, with all, that small all this, all, this, all, this, all this definitely <laughs> is, uh, I mean, uh, good if we had, if we had seen this in the beginning and planned it yeah, in the beginning. That's what, uh, but because this, this thing, this thing actually came uh, in. As a surprise in lab to you. Only yeah, very yeah. unexpected. Only after think, we had halfway through the. I think we have <laughs> exceeded the time for the much, much. Sure. Uh, Vijay, is it okay? The cases are interesting. We are exceeding the time. Is it okay? Yeah. Or you want us to rest it correct? Yes, sir. sir uh, yeah, sir. Sir, uh, we are perfectly okay. Okay, and please go to the next session. I think this is the last yeah. session, probably. So, yes, I yes. guess it's okay. No, I'm okay and because he, uh, they should not <laughs> think. Because uh, since, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, sir. So, the, the discussion is so interesting, even to me. Uh, uh, the, it is so much learning uh, going on for me, sir. Uh, yes. Because yes. we use sometimes uh, your expert comments uh, whenever we interact with the, uh, the power technologies with, with the upcoming doctors. And uh, so, so much good learning uh, going on, sir. So, the, I would like to invite Dr. Shahendra Trivedi. Uh, he is an attribute cardiology from Apollo Hospital in uh, for his next presentation. As the uh, title for the presentation is IVL for previous failed strain delivery. So, over to you, uh, Dr. Shahendra. Sir, uh, yeah, please. Uh, to all of you, thanks to uh, Trust Lumina and all the chairpersons and panel members for giving this opportunity to uh, share my one simple case relatively means uh, after seeing all these uh, cases which have been shown my case is pretty simple but it uh, it gives us an example of uh, using this technology for difficult stent delivery so I hope my presentation is uh, visible. Not yet open, sir. Click on that. Not yet, sir. Okay. I think you need to click on that big template. Is it visible now? Yeah, yeah. yeah yes, sir. Ahead. Yes, sir. So this one case where Previously, the stent could not be delivered uh, at another center and the patient had a recurrence of angina. So, uh, this 72-year-old gentleman has a previous PCI to RCA and circumflex four years back. Uh, he was a known diabetic and hypertensive. Uh, in February this year, he had COVID pneumonia from which he recovered but had rest angina. 
along with post covid fatigue on evaluation his ecg showed distinct changes and his clinical examination was unremarkable although the troponin was raised at the time and he was subjected to diagnostic cag followed by intervention at some other center i'll show you a few shots of the previous procedure uh, so this was the baseline lesion there and you can see the coronaries are calcified and there is a stent here, here in the circumflex uh, before the om uh, there is a short stent but the lesion was subtotal occlusion of this proximal lcx so the operator there they have uh, done the case here they have dilated with 1.5 balloon then uh, i have edited uh, many shots from their uh, record and they did many dilatations to dilate this region with uh, uh, upsizing of the nc balloons and uh, they even used the body wire and tried to deliver the stent and uh, in this shot you would appreciate that uh, at this point the stent is not going and there is a lot of haziness here uh, although we didn't do any imaging and because we don't have it uh, but my contention was that at this point there must be a uh, spur of calcium or maybe even more larger arc of calcium which was uh, preventing this stent to go ahead and uh, the previous operators they tried their best to deliver the stent but the stent never got beyond this point and this is the shot to just to show that the led was uh, okay uh, but because of this dilatation patient was angina free for a couple of months and but then again he had disabling angina although his lv function was preserved the biochemical parameters were good and uh, after reviewing his previous angiograms uh, i was sure to use a debulking device here so our options were ivl rotabulation cutting balloon uh, these are the things which are available with us here so this was the setup uh, angiogram and obviously there was a tight restenosis at that area so to cross this lesion i have used a whisper wire with microcatheter and then uh, obviously as already been discussed in the previous cases also uh, we should use a better wire after uh, after using a crossing wire and then i exchanged it with the grand slam wire so this is the microcatheter and we have removed the whisper wire and exchange it with grand slam wire after that i uh, did gradual dilatation of the lesion with 1.5 balloon nc balloon and you can see the clear vest here in the nc balloon at the same point where the stent was not uh, moving ahead so we prepared the lesion with uh, dilatation of uh, the lesion with uh, 2.5 nc balloon at high pressures and after that uh, i have used this ivl balloon i had to give six pulses this was the only the initial angiogram and gradually we saw that the uh, nerves portion of the balloon gradually gave away and there was a smooth dilatation of the area after giving six pulses of lithotripsy and this is a little bit longer uh, fluoro recording where you can see that the stent crossed the area of interest and finally we could deliver this stent we kept a wire in the led for obvious reasons because we have to cover the ostium of the circumflex the post uh, deployment of this stent the stent boost shows again in the same area there is uh, some under expansion of the stent which we finally dilated with the 3 mm nc balloon at a pressure of 22 atmospheres and this is the final result we got so the take home message is that coronary calcification is a challenge as we attempt to do more complex angioplasties ivl is definitely new weapon in our fort to tackle this problem 
IVL is relatively simple way to do, of course, with some limitations. With proper hardware selection and lesion preparation, IVL balloon is deliverable device in most of the cases. IVL has shown its usefulness in variety of scenarios along with other debulking devices. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Trivedi, sir, for uh, showing this uh, interesting case. I think there was a combination of a bend, a calcium, and a stent edge holding all the three together was uh, causing you more trouble. Even after yeah. preparation also, at the proximal portion of the stent, again, it was getting stuck slightly. So once, yeah. I think it was, uh, the thing which you did was uh, putting a good uh, grand slam type of wire and then taking the balloon. That's how I think IVL balloon also went. But IVL balloon also, yeah. you can see going too deep into the stent. It was there more in the proximal portion of the stent, less so beyond that bend. So bend was also troubling here more. We see it quite commonly in LCX when it takes a very difficult, more than 90 degrees turn, obtuse yeah. turns, it creates trouble. I think uh, finally uh, you could manage because the lesion was a little shorter also. Yeah, but yeah. many of the times the proximal LCX, the ostium is again very difficult for us. The patients tend to come back with restenosis in the yeah, ostium. Yeah, yeah. That's where I think uh, you try to, try to dilate it optimally again because of some slight under expansion there. I think uh, comments, sir, Dr. Arun, sir, or uh, Bali Jain. I, I think uh, the Goodfrey done case in under dilated uh, heavily calcified region. But circumflex ostium is not something which is going to last for a very long period of time. Yeah. I think this case uh, should have been converted into a left main bifurcation for long term uh, result. Because of the ostium of LED so a little bit diseased. So be prepared for him to come back to you in six months time, and then you can do a left main bifurcation. That's what my suggestion is. I thought Let's there see. was some LED narrowing at the end of the procedure, uh, but you must have seen, uh, you are of course finally the best judge as to what was the final result uh, in the LED. In the one small shot that we saw, it looked as if uh, there is some narrowing in the LED too. But yes, uh, very well done. No, what, what Sir is telling was uh, if the, uh, the chance of coming back is more, but if, uh, unless the LED is, uh, has some compromise there, I don't think we need to advocate a straight away bifurcation state. I don't think you mean that, no, sir. Because in future, if he comes back with restenosis at the LCX ostium, at that time, some plaque would also go extend into more into the LED ostium. There, it will become a right candidate for bifurcation type of stent. As of now, I think what is done is okay. Because unless the LED ostium is, uh, has uh, some problem or some... By in the process of doing this, LED gets compromised something. I don't think straight away we should do left main bifurcation. We, we had checked carefully in different yeah, yeah, views uh, that uh, the LED ostium was uh, okay and it did not require any intervention in our yeah, Manoj is uh, chatting a question saying that would you do FFR? If you feel any doubt of uh, LED flow or anything, probably they would have done it. But he was felt comfortable with Anjo and the way it was Feeling that's so why they didn't plan for FFR, I think. Any other comments, yeah. Dr. Jain? It's now two months since the procedure and patient, yeah. the patient is coming for follow up. What Dr. Bali said that probably he has to be under close follow up. Yeah, true. Or a restenosis of the Austin LCX. But they are very notorious to get uh, restenosis. Suppose if LCX ostium only has restenosis, Jain. LED is perfectly all right. Left man is perfectly all right. He has to what? convert into <laughs> LMC to LCX and then see how LED behaves. LED uh -huh. behaves fine. Leave it. Just open the struts for future intervention LED. And LED dissects or flow is compromised. Then you have to convert into tap. Some people also are trying only usage of drug eluting balloon in the LCX ostiums. But by and large, it also doesn't work properly. Many of the times you end up using a stent and things like that. I think if there are no further comments, we'll go to the next case. Yes, sir. So the, now I'd like to invite Dr. Pankaj Jariwala. Uh, sir is a senior international cardiologist from Yashoda Hospital, Hyderabad. So over to you, Dr. Pankaj, uh, please present your case. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, all my senior colleagues and friends. Uh, this is one difficult case which we encountered in this pandemic. And she is basically an 87 year old female who came to us with the chest discomfort and breathlessness at rest NYHA class four for last one week. And she's my previous patient and uh, 11 years back, I have done her primary angioplasty for inferior MI and right coronary artery. And now she was admitted outside with suspected COVID-19. And she was referred to uh, me uh, because the relatives knows me because I have done initial treatment for her 
because her pro troponin levels were elevated and there was severe left ventricular dysfunction. Uh, and then uh, the CT chest shows bilateral pleural effusion uh, with CORAD3 changes. Her RT-PCR done, which was negative, and uh, her BNP levels was very high, like more than 23,000. And uh, initially when she came to me, I stabilized her with diuretics, nitrates and beta blockers and uh, picagrelor and statin. And uh, so angiography uh, we planned, but uh, we, our plan was to do a procedure in the same sitting because she's an elderly female with a high risk candidate. So the heart team approach, uh, they said that uh, uh, severe LV dysfunction, the support of intraortic balloon pump, uh, the possibility of tortuous aorta in this age, so long femoral sheath, coronary calcification when it is possibility, then IVL and rotablation in standby, and for pain management and cardiorespiratory compromise, anesthesia team in standby. So this was the preparation, and you can see the angiography, which can show that there is a very critical uh, bifurcation, Medina 111, uh, stenosis of the distal left main involving the ostium of the LAD and the circumflex. Uh, right coronary artery also was uh, nearly normal. There was no restenosis of the stent, which I have deployed 11 years back. There was some disease in the significant disease in the proximal part of the obtuse marginal. And LAD also had some disease, but not much significant. So the culprit lesion was this distal. Uh, bifurcation left main stenosis with some uh, calcium was seen. So of course the aorta and we do the uh, uh, deployment of the intraortic balloon from, from the left femoral artery and the uh, circumflex was difficult to wire. And as the angle and the plaque was not allowing the wire to cross. And despite I wanted to use uh, filter FC, uh, hydrophilic coating wire, but it was not able to cross. So what I did is initially uh, plaque modification by using a 2 into 12 mm balloon, and that could uh, help me to cross the circumflex. So because of a lot of tortuosities, uh, putting wires deep into the bed was a little difficult. And uh, every time the, the wires used to come out. So it was one of the difficulties. So the predilatation of the circumflex ostium also was done using 2.5 balloon. And then passing stent was a little difficult, uh, but one is to one predilatation using a 3.5 NC balloon uh, could uh, give us a good result. And I could pass four into 21 uh, resolute onyx stent from LMCA to LCX because the size of the LCX and the LM was nearly same. Ivers could not cross at this point of time. So I wanted to do Ivers after predilatation, but there was, because of calcium and all, it was very difficult. So we went with the angiographic judgment and uh, deployed the stent. There was bad accordion effect into the circumflex. As I was not getting good support into the uh, optus marginal, I went into the native circumflex uh, and for the better support of my wire. And then I did pot using 4.5 into 12 mm, mm uh, NC balloon into the proximal uh, part of the stent. And then uh, after opening the struts of the, I could deploy into to the LA ostium uh, in different uh, views. And uh, this is after the deployment of the stent. And then I performed a kissing balloon uh, using four into 12 and three into 12 NC balloons, uh, followed by a uh, repot was done using same 4.5 into 12 mm balloon. And then at this point of time, I could do the IVAS. Of course, I don't have pictures of IVAS, but there was a, this was done only to ensure the proper uh, expansion of the stent. So the other lesions uh, we thought is not important at this point of time, and we will stage it uh, in coming days uh, if patient is still symptomatic. She had protracted course after the procedure in the hospital. She required a lot of non-invasive ventilation, including BiPAP. Uh, her hemoglobin dropped, so we have to give one uh, correction of her anemia. Then heart failure management was very difficult. 
and uh, I have to use dipaglyphosine, which was relatively contraindicated in unstable. She has infection control using antibiotics. Almost seven days she stayed post procedure, total hospitalization for 13 days. She's on regular follow up now, has completed almost six months without any further uh, recurrence of her symptoms. So, take home message is elective double vessel stenting is a treatment of choice for Medina 111 left main lesion, particularly in older age substrate like uh, octogenarian people, where the risk of surgery is very, very high. IABP is very cost effective and mechanical circulatory assist device, which is available and very handy. Newer drugs and coronary hardwares, they are additions to our armamentarium. Though sometimes there are some relative contraindications, but cautiously we should use in some of the patients for better uh, outcomes. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations, uh, Pankaj, uh, for showing this effective case. I think uh, if you can mask your video, I think sound will come better. Anyway, now presentation is over. Uh, congratulations, uh, Pankaj, for uh, showing this uh, case and uh, saving the patients, elderly patients' life. And uh, IABP putting a placement in the, before uh, doing everything was, I think, uh, very important. Uh, though data shows otherwise, very we, all of us have experienced that IABP helps, especially in the patient has severe dysfunction and likely to go into LVF, things like that. Placement of IABP helps. And that was very dareful on your part to uh, dilate and uh, even without the wire across LCX, fortunately, you got away. But uh, many of the times we'll be worried to do that. And uh, probably, as you said, the plug got modified differently. That's how you could do it, uh, wiring after the balloon dilatation. But if it was going to LAD, I think the track from that side, when you when you come back, this you must have tried. Just some other uh, tips I'm telling. Going to LAD, then try to come back. That's where this eccentric tortuosities you could get into LCX uh, before dilatation itself, if possible. But you must have tried all that, and then finally you did it. But the LCX occludes at that point of time, then it will be a big mess for us. So luckily that uh, didn't happen. God is great. We do with uh, good intentions. Uh, God helps us. Other important thing, I think you are very careful in placing the 4mm stent, not to get beyond that bifurcation of the LCX. That's where OM and LCX were bifurcating. Yes. Then once you, uh, that is very important to assess because otherwise your bigger dilate diameter stent goes beyond. Then you would dissect and produce trouble there. I think correctly you placed that in the distal extent of LCX uh, compared to from the left main to LCX. Another thing, part and other things, what you did uh, were good and that's how the patient improved. And the tough COVID, this patient uh, was COVID positive when you were doing all this? No, sir. COVID recovered. negative. Uh, yeah. Actually, it was suspected case of COVID because of the uh, pulmonary edema. Uh, she had CT changes which are similar to uh, COVID. Yeah, this is another thing. Many of the times, pulmonary edema, yeah. Many of these times, pulmonary edema people are reporting as uh, Corad yeah. positives and uh, COVID patients. So initially, but, in first wave of COVID, uh, many such cases of cardiac cases we yeah. uh, rejected to admit because of the COVID. Switch and, off, uh, switch off your video. The, the voice is not coming. Switch off your video. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. actually, yeah. we lost many of such cases. Yeah, yeah. Uh, recently also I had one case where two times RT-PCR was done because pulmonologist was stressing that uh, it is a COVID case and uh, the D-dimer and interleukin and all can be positive in the patients of acute left ventricular failure because of the inflammation is there in, even in the heart failure. So many of the times we misdiagnose and troponin T positive can happen even in COVID-19 patients. So yes. uh, sometimes it is difficult to decide uh, but the very fact that she improved the procedure suggests that everything was ischemia and pulmonary edema. But yeah. uh, one thing I wanted to make uh, for the youngsters is in this COVID times, the more longer the procedures we are doing for the COVID positive patients, the more likely for the operators and sisters likely to become positive. Even if you are forced to do something, do a quick job and come out. Not in this patient, I'm generally telling. And though we have performed primary PCIs uh, in COVID positive patients, the more longer the exposure, the more likely you tend to get become positive in spite. But the N95 mask and what is that is uh, saving a lot of doctors. But in spite of all following all these precautions, many of our staff unfortunately also got infected. We should be careful. Thank you, Pankaj, for showing Thank this uh, interesting case.
and any comments uh, just, from jain uh, uh, just a, Arun, go uh, ahead uh, just a small point one is of course the fact that iabp prophylactically used is useful used. when we use iabp as a bailout then it is uh, not very useful and that's why in such cases prophylactic use is uh, recommended the uh, only other small point is uh, in such a case before trying uh, to you know uh, dilate the led and taking a chance with the sarcostium you could uh, try with the double lumen catheter uh, like a crusade catheter which can be parked uh, you know at the origin of the led and then you can sometimes uh, negotiate a wire into the circumflex with that because uh, this is uh, the last thing you do before uh, you know giving up the case mm. and if in this time the sir concludes then obviously yeah, one is in bad actually trouble. the the thing is sir in this uh, case uh, uh, the 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 recommendation for doing plaque modification is we should use little longer balloon so if you if you can see in my angio uh, in the balloon which i have taken which is going from the normal segment to the normal segment across the plaque so if you use a small balloon like 2 into 8 mm or something like that then uh, the chances of plaque getting shifted into the lcx and icx getting closure is possible so the recommendation for plaque modification is take 2 into 15 mm balloon which is little longer balloon so what it does uniformly it tries to modify the plaque rather than closing the uh, circumflex lesion so uh, initially uh, we used to use 1.5 into 8 or 1.5 into 10 such a small balloon which can cause that kind of thing so if you do a, a dilatation with a good balloon minimum balloon should be 2 or 2.25 and a longer balloon so that uh, prevents the sudden occlusion of the vessel and that is well described technique when you are not able to cross the side branch plaque modification can be done of course you have to take the risk of uh, side branch occlusion so whatever uh, it is pankaj but uh, the, in the presence of very critical uh, side branch stenosis like how we had here lcx very critical stenosis it's all quite challenging and uh, therefore uh, to do that because if it uh, that mild lesion some significant some not much of very critical stenosis it would be okay but lcx ostium looked very quite uh, critical stenosis here that's how uh, they were suggesting other methods but the point is always try to wire before you do all that the last resort what you did worked so that's good and uh, manoj said uh, probably usage of impella would also help i think uh, uh, it's a costly affair now as of now if patient can afford it uh, that can also be done but uh, he got away with using uh, abp and another thing uh, message is uh, vijay has internet request you to please announce the next speaker okay nagendra uh, vijay o to i think they are uh, yes, telling us about the time go to the next case right yes sir. so the, i would like to invite dr nagendra bhupati for uh, his uh, presentation uh, sir is uh, assistant professor department of cardiology with srmc hospital tamil nadu so over to you sir thank you for this opportunity transumula team uh, many of my teachers are here i am so glad to be here it was a nice uh, to be here among this uh, august audience so i will be discussing about our experience of using op in balloon in uh, during this 2020 and 2021 it's just an interim analysis not a complete analysis during this last one one to I mean 14 months we have used uh, nine, in nine, we have studied 19 patients and 36 lesions the mean age of the patients was 67 predominantly they were male most of them were having non st elevation mi rather than chronic stable angina uh, mean lv function was uh, 44.5% uh, 8% were having uh, were having cardiogenic shock at that point of time the study lesion include the uh, 36 out of them six were circumflex and left main 18 were lad and eight were rca and none of we have not attempted using this balloon in grafts uh, lesions we don't have experience of using this balloon in graft lesions all of them are type c lesions and nine were having a typical 111 bifurcation medina lesion a strategy we followed uh, we followed the same strategy suggested by kukuli from switzerland who is one of the proprietor of this uh, balloon uh, sizing it 0.5 mm smaller than the proposed predicted stent size for pre dilatation and sizing it 1 to 1 uh, reference to the distal mean diameter uh if you are concerned about uh, any high risk perforation in a particular anatomy we did even we intentionally decrease it to 0.25 mm post stenting so we almost always used a um, uh, semi compliant i mean non compliant most of the time 80% and two patient we have used a semi compliant balloon before delivering this uh, 
opn balloon uh, pre opn rota was utilized in one fourth of the patients mostly only one opn was used except for two patients in whom the balloon ruptured so we have to use the second balloon the average pressure that have been uh, that have been used in pre stent uh, that is uh, ballooning the lesion before delivering a stent that is we, i call it as pre stent opening is 35 36 mm the average pressure that we reached uh, for post stent optimization is something around 40 mm this is the clinical results uh, timi 3 flow coronary flow not the myocardial flow was uh, obtained in 100% of patients spiral dissection was used uh, uh, observed after uh, opn in one patient after using a 2 mm balloon uh, that prevented us to escalate us from uh, to a rotablation so we have to gradually upscale the upscale the uh, balloon size from a smaller to a larger balloon the same patient had one uh, had a tamponade the tamponade happened after aggressive post dilatation not with the opn balloon but with a regular 3.5 mm nc balloon i went up to 24 mm atmosphere because of under expansion that was a mistake i think i should have taken a 3o opn balloon or a 3.5 opn balloon go to a uh, 3 3o should be a, should have been a choice uh, the patient we utilized a covered stent in the particular patient she she was discharged well it uh, happened in september last month she is doing fine two balloons ruptured as i told earlier one 2.5 mm opn balloon other one in in led and 3.5 in mid led and 3.5 in left main uh there was no significant difficulty that was encountered after after uh, preparing the bed for stent implantation one patient who was in cardiogenic shock out of the, the 8% of the patients uh, died due to refractory septic shock this is our experience of using opn balloon in our center so i will be describing about some of the cases i mean i can you can uh, the, uh, the chair person and the moderator can ask me uh, to stop the presentation at any point of time so this is the uh, patient uh, who has got a non ischemic elevation mi recovered from aka uta post covid almost all the patients are uh, post covid i mean the operator can be post covid i don't know uh, it's it, it happens these days uh, i hope you guys are staying staying safe uh, this is the patient who has a critical uh, uh, osteal led and left main uh, distal left main bifurcation lesion uh, circumflex is uh, ram has a ramus intermedius lesion uh, has a ramus intermedius with a a uh, kind of moderate sized uh, om uh, i mean uh, lpl that continues from the circumflex a long segment diffuse uh, lesion in the led plan is to rotablate since we thought of rotablating the mid led also we didn't take 1.75 bar otherwise i would have definitely opted for 1.75 bar if at all i am planning to ablating in this portion we want to ablate in this portion also we didn't want to go here because angiographically at least uh, there was no calcium documented in this portion Uh, that was the mistake that i did in this particular patient so we ablated the entire left main and led territory up to the mid led segment we found significant difficulty in getting the wire uh, distal to this lesion you can see uh, that was the scariest moment if the burke is going to touch this already a question we all know what will happen it may snap the wire so this the post rotor shot later on ivas was done uh, 2.520 the nc balloon i i the no expand no no proper expansion of the bed was observed here after 2o opn uh, there was a decent expansion of uh, bed was observed we were happy with the result then wolverine was done for the proximal uh, lesions uh, left cell of main and the proximal led this is the post wolverine shot it looks uh, uh, looks acceptable bed preparation proceeded with pci multiple uh, three stents were done for short of uh, want of time i have not showed the procedures there are straight forward procedures went ahead this is the angiography that is being shown after deploying the stents some under definite under expansion is seen in this portion after the diagonal uh, opn this time we took a 2.5 the lumen diameter was 2.3 uh, the distal reference mean diameter i don't want to take a bigger balloon uh, than 2.5 since we pre dilated before with 2o we took a 2.5 here went up to 45 mm uh, sorry 45 atms not mm atms this is the final end result Uh, there is some under expansion seen at the level, but angiographic. I mean, I was wise. We could have achieved uh, luminal uh, area of 90% as compared to the distal reference area. We thought uh, that's done. We I can't take a 2.75 is not available. I can't take a 3O balloon for the vessel which has got a lumen diameter of 2.3. We accepted with this result and we uh, stopped the procedure. Patient is doing fine. Four months follow up. Uh, this is a patient which was done in the beginning of last year. A diabetic, uh, hypertensive in pure LMS, lysed. Uh, post mi angina my lb dysfunction uh, this is the tight lesion for want of time we are going with the pictures alone eccentric tight lesions uh, 2.515 nc balloon waist didn't disappear uh, you could see appreciate the lesion 2.3.0 nc balloon waist disappear again the same waist is uh, observed in the angiography 
and three o angio scalp uh, the dog bone effect could be seen here and again uh, the, uh, this is the angio after the angio scalp i thought okay let me go with 3.5 nc this was the initial uh, uh, area initial time when we were we have not used the opn uh, in large, large large amount of patients so this is a 3.5 nc balloon waist didn't disappear uh, we are stuck now uh, then we used 3o opn balloon you could appreciate the uh, bone getting open yeah that's it uh, with this uh, i would suggest the, i mean uh, uh, in um, i would suggest the, i mean suggest that once the opn is going to open be prepared your cover stand that we don't know what is going to be ready so always when i use opn i ask me text to keep uh, the appropriate size cover stand ready so that we people don't run around to get at the point when it is required good amount of dissection is seen that's the good for the uh, deliverability and expansion of the stents later on you know, the end result is uh, end result was okay sorry it's not playing we could appreciate we could uh, do a good result in this particular patient this is third patient uh, elderly female post pcvi done by us uh, four years before if we used uh, sent in uh, led and in rc in 2017 presented again with unstable angina she had a very tight uh, rca lesion which was intervened there's a borderline uh, uh, led lesion so 2.75 stent which was done without utilizing it was done uh, utilizing uh, it was not done utilizing imaging during that point of time uh, there is a, a kind of borderline lesion after the uh, diagonal and uh, the kind of borderline lesion after the uh, distal at the, at the distal edge of the stent thought of doing if a first said tricky lesion because we 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 uh, we got the knowledge of uh, not utilizing ffr whenever the vessel is too tortuous by creating accordion uh, so this is a lesion after uh, this is the uh, initial angiography this is the accordion that was created by the ffr wire this created significant drop in ffr so i would suggest not to use ffr any kind of invasive wire based modality to use uh, to assess the significance of lesion whenever we are getting accordion that's what i learned from this case then we used ivers the ivers showed a minimal lumen area of 2.7 47 then we proceeded with intervening this uh, lesion with a 3048 everlum cellotic stent kissing was done this this is the post dilatation ivers was done to optimize the result this time this is the 4.92 area after dilating the lesion with a 30 nc balloon uh, this is the uh, ivers which shows after uh, doing a opn up to 35 atmospheric pressure So this is the same 3O NC and 3O OPN. You can appreciate the dilatation here, 4.92. You can appreciate the area here, 6.48. A uh, good amount of luminal gain has been obtained with the OPN uh, with the same size of NC balloon. 3O NC is not equivalent to 3O OPN. We are definitely getting a better, a better uh, lumen. This is what we learned after using same size um, O NC balloon and same size OPN balloon. After that, we are not doing any imaging. A few cases we did like that. We observed that luminal gain is significantly much better with them. Um, same sized uh, opn as compared with uh, same size nc balloon later on uh, for want of time and uh, uh, we are not utilizing uh, ivers for every case initially we started using ivers now we are not using ivers in every case this is the final ivers uh, final imaging result of the same patient she is doing fine uh, four months follow up at present she flying moving to delhi she is staying in delhi came here is basically a uh, person of tamil nadu native living in delhi this is another patient 86 year old male and stable angina old pca 2.75 into 18 Uh, done uh, six years, uh, five years ago, uh, under distal pobile to long segment LAD, stage three uh, CKD, anemia, moderate to severe MR, moderate to severe elbow dysfunction, double vessel disease with ISR of LAD. So that's a osteal proximal new lesion. This is a distal edge uh, ridge nosis in the uh, LAD short segment and uh, in segment and uh, edge nosis of the LAD. Uh, good for this patient that this long segment distal nosis the remains paired patent after poba. So the uh, Grunsing's technology still works even now. We used imaging. We deployed the stent. This is after uh, we dilating with after the uh, we dilated with the three point five NC balloon in the proximal segment, and uh, and in the mid segment also we go with went with the three point five NC balloon up to two hundred ATMs. Uh, we didn't go to high pressure here. After that we used the three O NC ten to high pressure, uh, almost forty. We got a acceptable result in this patient. Uh, we went away uh, with this. The luminal area of the left main was seven point eight, so we didn't uh, do anything for the left main. Left main at that point of time. Uh, this is another. Think, uh, yeah. Nagendra, you have uh, finished twelve minutes, exceeded two yeah, minutes. Can we stop, stop here? I, uh, I can stop, sir. No problem. Anything interesting in the last? Anything you want to highlight? You can. Otherwise, we'll stop. That's have it. That's it. Nothing else. This is the, this is the case where even IVL didn't go OP and went. That's it. this is the patient with the cardiogenic shock. This is the anatomy. Uh, I mean, nothing more complex than what Dr. Monoj has actually showed. So this is the patient. Um, the, this patient is no. This one patient whom we lost. 
uh, because of not cardiac issue issue he had a multi drug resistant metalloproteinase producing organism in his blood acinetobacter because of which uh, it was even resistant to colistin because of which he succumbed so we i did ivl to this patient and i will show the end result we did i was everything was optimized well the lv function improved from uh, improved from uh, 25% to actually 45% over a period of week uh, but in hospital uh, maybe i should have i might have removed the ibp he, we put ibp kept it for two days on anticoagulation uh, after removing ibp acute lymph ischemia went for embolectomy uh, post embolectomy started having fever uh, that's it then that was point of no return uh we, we we could not solve this patient with this i would like to uh, end my talk yeah congratulations nagendra for uh, showing interesting cases and uh, that's how i think if you get a touch of fellowship abroad no you your orientation towards work also changes you start analyzing data more carefully and then you will come out with research papers which indians lack actually you have learned that from dr samim sharma it looks so opn balloon analysis and whatever data you have you no know, if you analyze and come out with proper results it would always help in india we do lot of cases but somehow we are lacking you are showing that path also nagendra uputi congratulations for that thank you sir. and uh, some of these cases what you have, uh, other insights what you mentioned uh, regarding opn are very true one thing is uh, sizing like you never oversize opn balloon which lands into uh, problems like uh, perforation and things like that if you control the size well slightly probably take quarter size less but uh, go to higher pressures that's a mantra to prevent uh, uh, complications and the other thing what you interestingly showed is uh, the post opn balloon dilatation you got a better area compared to nc balloon probably this you have better pressure higher pressure and you demonstrated it effectively with ivers these are the, some of the good points which you have mentioned other important thing is the tortuous vessels we have noticed this many times don't perform ffr because of stiff nature of the wire itself you get into accordion and uh, tend to get into trouble and uh, that also you have shown it effectively uh, apart from other cases and uh, thank you for showing such interesting cases dr arun sir or jain or bali sir i think we can move on um, yeah. i think because interest of time i think we should move on i just i just want to make a comment on nagendra wonderful job done thank uh, you sir point you made bali sir was uh, my teacher during my md time so i can't uh, we are my <laughs> uh, point you made about opn getting a larger luminal diameter than the nc Uh, i would like you to analyze was it one is to one opn used there as versus one is to one nc because whichever nc balloon is there when you go to high pressure it doesn't 3 mm doesn't stay 3 mm even nc it goes to 3.15 or something like that similarly opn if you're using at high pressure 40 mm 40 atmosphere then you are increasing the diameter of that so if you're increasing the diameter of uh, opn balloon using a one is to one as compared to nc balloon using a 24 or 28 atmosphere uh, opn balloon definitely will give you a larger diameter that is precisely the reason why we see more perforations with the opn balloon that's precisely the reason why we recommend a 0.25 mm lesser opn diameter in a vessel so i would like you to analyze it further to see when you are saying is it the pressure mediated uh, change or is it a diameter mediated change in the diameter of the vessel so your point is well taken sir with all due respect sir If you take a three millimeter NC, there is under expansion. We are taking a three millimeter NC according to the size of the circumference. The dog boning because of dog boning perforation happens in the proximal or in the distal portion, and it doesn't influence the waist. In contrast to OP and balloon, while it is, it, it doesn't create a significant amount of dog boning size because of the double balloon, balloon and balloon kind of architecture. It doesn't go more than ten to twenty percent. Even at the RBP of thirty-five uh, millimeter, the gain at Produced by uh, diameter gain produced by opn is only 0.1 millimeter for a ten percent. So 3.3 millimeter balloon can go up to 3.3. Unlike NC balloon, while the at the waist portion it doesn't go in the non-waist portion because of dog bone it goes to 3.3 balloon goes to 3.5 in the proximal and distal edges and cause perforation. So I, mean, I don't have a large experience. Sir. It's only uh, treating some 36 lesions. No, that uh, that point what you are mentioning is uh, well known, uh, Nagendra. What sir is mentioning is. At higher pressures, this uh, opn balloon will become like ten percent more. What you are telling, yes. so you could get a better uh, lumen area compared to NC balloon. Uh, yes, even if it is without dog boning, also proper expansion of NC balloon also it may not go ten twenty percent higher. It remains exactly at the same size. That's how the areas which you get by opn could be larger. That's what sir meant. Yes, sir. I think. That, uh, yeah. The complications think, are actually lower with uh, the with one the, perforation yeah. which I had in the series because of NC balloon, not because of opn balloon, sir. Yes. Yes. 
I think we'll move on over to Vijay. Can you call the next? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the our next uh, is Dr. Arun uh, Srinivas. He is actually a cardiology from Apollo Hospital, Mysore. Sir, uh, requesting you to please uh, share your presentation. Yeah, uh, is that visible? And am I audible? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Vijay. And a very good evening to Dr. Shrinivas Kumar, Arun Chopra sir, Dr. Bali sir, and uh, R K Jain sir. I have a simple but a common problem that we encounter in day-to-day -day practice: a very calcific ostial LED stenosis. And obviously, we have discussed all the possible. Uh, uh, devices that can be used. So I'll just present a case where I tried rotablation and failed, and then we'll see what else could be done. Sorry to disturb you, sir. Please share your presentation is not visible, sir. Is it? Okay, sorry. Uh, please, yeah, please share your presentation, sir. Uh, now, is it true? Uh, not yet, sir. Okay, now? No, sir. No, sir. Still not visible? No, no sir. Okay. okay, then... Uh, Probably I'll have to log out and log into the meeting again because I've done everything that I could be, be done. Okay, sir. I think we'll go to next presenter. You can coolly present after that presentation. Yeah, what I'll do is I'll uh, log out and enter the meeting again. Please, sir. Just to request Dr. Subhashish Roy Chaudhary. Uh, Dr. Subhashish uh, is international cardiologist from Amri Hospital, Calcutta. So, uh, so please, if you can share your presentation with us. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Audible. Your presentation is visible, sir. Okay. Good evening and greetings from Kolkata. And uh, my case, I'll be trying to highlight the importance of uh, imaging pre and during uh, an opera, during a procedure. So this patient was a 55-year-old diabetic male who was admitted with uh, not very uh, typical symptoms of dizziness and uh, chest pain. He had a history of an old inferior wall MI, a reduced ejection fraction. He had undergone a primary PTCA two years ago. And at that point of time, uh, the operator had seen an LED lesion, just distal to the major diagonal and septal, but had left it after having done a post MI TMT, which came out to be normal and uh, a technician study, which did not document any ischemia at the LED territory. So after that, he had been on medical therapy thereafter and had been asymptomatic till now. So at this point of time, an angio was done. And these are the pictures of the left angiography. And here will, he will appreciate the LED lesion with a very complicated anatomy, a diagonal coming off uh, very proximally and showing heavy calcification. The calcification is visible even before the dye comes in. And so before uh, taking a decision whether we should be intervening on this, we did uh, physiological assessment. The RFR came out to be 0.9 and the FFR with uh, IV adenosine was 0.79, so it was significant. We did a pre-PCI OCT run. And in the run, we could appreciate that there was a heavy calcification, especially a calcium nodule just beyond the diagonal. Here is the picture of the calcium nodule. The, uh, the left main was elliptical, uh, but of a uh, good enough size. So we were worried about how to deal with this calcium nodule. So uh, he had a syntax score of uh, syntax two score of 26. The PCI and CABG both had a 4 year mortality of 5%, and the relatives offered uh, both the options to PCI. 
So we knew we had uh, to use some debulking device. We went in with a femoral approach, seven uh, EVU catheter. Started off with a 1.5 bar rotor. And after having done the rotor, this is a 3.6 flex tome at high pressures. This is the 3.6 flex tome. And we observed that it was opening a bit eccentrically. These are the pictures of uh, the artery after the rotor and the flex tome. And I'll hold it for you here. Yes. So we are not very happy with the expansion there in the LED. But yes, there was a bit of dissection there. So we too did a repeat pedilation with a scoring balloon, a three balloon at high pressures. But still, we found that it was unaltered. At this point of time, we took a difficult decision of going in again with a 1.75 rotor. We knew that the artery was at least 3.5 millimeter in diameter. But we went at lower uh, RPMs of 1.4 1 and we did for shorter times of 12 seconds. This is a picture after the 1.75 rotor and we thought that this looked a little better. I'll try and hold it for you. Okay. We thought it looked a little better. Did a 3.512 NC balloon uh, dilation and in this case, the crest was lesser. And then did an IVUS run. Uh, basically, the angioplasty was done on a different date compared to the previous angiography OCT imaging. So and on this day, we did not have the OCT. So, and did the IVUS run. And in the IVUS run, we found that we had an acceptable uh, uh, lumen at the, at the region of the uh, diagonal. But the solitary calcium nodule that could be uh, that was visible prior was still there. Uh, but a, a considerable amount of lumen had been achieved. We had been able to crack a part of the calcium. So with this knowledge, we went in stenting from the left main to LED with the 3.538 DES. And doing aggressive close dilation with the 3.5 balloon and a 4 balloon in the proximal part. And this is what it looked like after aggressive post dilation. You will note that you would be skeptical to leave it at this point in the LED. So here we did another IVAS run. And uh, I'd like you to spend some time seeing the IVAS where the calcium comes in. The stent is well opposed throughout its course. But obviously, the calcium nodule can be seen just beyond the diagonal. So the question was what next to be done, either lithotripsy, which was not available at that point of time. And uh, yes, there was the option of doing an OPNNC. What we measured in the IVAS is that we had achieved an area of 6.94 in the MLA at the area of uh, interest. And at this point of time, we thought that uh, stent expansion in non-LMC sites we knew was the target MSA was more than 5.5. And a literature review, which we did later, and I would like to, you, to go through this, is that IVAS has been relatively consistent in showing that a strength cross-sectional area of 5.5 best discriminates subsequent events and non-left main lesions. The doctor's trial had showed the optimal cutoff to predict the post-procedural FFR, FFR of more than nine was 5.44. And in the registries, had identified that anything more than 4.5 on OCT as a threshold for discriminating patients with MACE. So having achieved 6.94, this was uh, uh, enough to predict that uh, the FFR would be negative and that the strength, sec strength cross-sectional area would uh, prevent future uh, MACE. Taking everything into consideration, we left the lesion at this because it was well opposed and it was uh, more, it was almost seven in a lot of non-left main region. So the take home messages is uh, 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 assessing uh, the lesion physiologically uh, helped us to signify, uh, find it out the significant. The OCT helped us to choose the plaque modification strategy. And most importantly, uh, it helped us to take the, the difficult decision of leaving the stent slightly underexpanded, but well opposed with the MLA of 6194. I would be very eager to 
hear your comments on this. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Shubhash, uh, for showing this uh, case. I think uh, Bali sir uh, wants to tell something first. You can go uh, ahead. Can go ahead. I just wanted to say that we have a left main to LED stand, and we have four millimeter stand. And we do not have sufficient stent in the left main and a pot, which I believe should be done in all patients who have a left main to have any crossover stent. Uh, any special reason for the, not doing a pot or only having four five millimeters in the left main? Uh, not, not, re not really, it was the logistic issue of stents that we had on that particular day. But you went a lot distally. That much was not required distally, I thought, after the lesion. You could got it a little more because... What sir is making the point is you should have adequate uh, uh, length of the stent in the left main to do proper part. Otherwise, you could land in the edges in the trouble. Other thing, uh, what I thought is uh, what you started, it looked like a borderline lesion in angiography. FFR kept positive, okay. that's why uh, you were exactly. uh, forced to do it. And exactly. this eccentric uh, eccentric uh, uh, nodules, calcific nodule is always a trouble. Uh, for us uh, in dealing day to day rather than the total circular thing. We don't have a definite solution for the eccentric calcific nodules. I think uh, that's where sometimes you could uh, land in trouble, though you had a good uh, area overall which could give a positive outcome. So, but we sometimes feel very uncomfortable. The stent is uh, totally un unexpanded. Here you got about 90%, 10% of under expansion may be okay, but if it is more than that, probably uh, you tried opian balloon in this use. No, sir. We, uh, at 6.94, we left it because it was an eccentric calcium and we yeah. feared that uh, it may rupture. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. That is true. But uh, so generally, if you are, if it is more under expansion, many of the times the opium balloons have helped in such sort of scenarios also. And uh, where there is also a bandage, we see in multiple views, it also looks like there's a bandage in the vessel where it looks like little under expansion. Sometimes the bends and the calcium together also could lead to worse appearance. I think we are running quite short. We'll go to the next case. Uh, Jane or uh, Arun sir, any, anything you want to say? No, I, uh, we... uh, what was the size of the stand, uh, Dr. Arun? It was 3.5. The length, sir? No, no, the diameter, diameter. of the stand. It was a 3.5, sir. Okay, so with 3.5, uh, using uh, the area, it would be around 9.5 uh, square millimeter. So there was a 30% residual. Definitely. I would have tried with the uh, OPN. Uh, OPN, but uh, I agree you left it uh, taking care that 6.9 was a reasonable MLA. Uh, but I would have normally tried with uh, okay. an OPN before giving up. But let's move on, I think. Okay. I think next presentation. Good case. Good, interesting. Uh, good. good evening. Is my PPT uh, visible now? Yeah, yeah. It's visible, sir. Yeah, okay, fine. So we'll uh, have a case of an Australian lady. First time you click on uh, left 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 uh, base of the slide, first point, then it works through the lab laptop. Yeah, That's okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, fine. Now, yeah, this is a 68 year old uh, gentleman, hypertensive diabetic normal creatinine, admitted with acute coronary syndrome and uh, anterior wall uh, non stabilization MI. He had a calcific uh, severe LED stenosis and a calcific large ramus intermedius as well. And uh, he continued to have severe angina, was advised uh, CABG, but he was not willing basically because he was the only, only earning member and he was uh, almost like a daily wages person. So he didn't want to lose uh, that many days off his work you know this is his led you can see his ramus and circumflex are reasonable the circumflex after the om1 has got some lesion but beyond that it's a small vessel basically his uh, proximal led was the uh, reason for his pain here you will see the very acute angle of the led artery with almost 99 percent osteostenosis and a reasonable amount of calcium the plan was here of course to do a rotablator and stent to the LAD artery and uh, initially the lesion was crossed with a whisper wire with the help of a micro catheter exchanged to a rota floppy wire and with a 1.5 mm uh, bur, five ablation runs were tried, would not cross the lesion. In the meantime, he had very severe chest pain, bradycardia, hypotension, a temporary pacing wire was of course uh, in place 
he was uh, resuscitated with IV fluids and mifentermine, etc. And because of this uh, very severe reaction to that uh, rotablation attempt, the rotablation was stopped. We'll just have a look at some of the pictures. This is, of course, just before the wiring. This was the wire across the lesion. And uh, once we did that, we started doing the rotablator runs with initially some, we thought some advance was being made, but absolutely nothing. It was not going into the LAD artery at all. Even here, you see there were multiple trials were made and later on some further push was tried. More sustained pressure was given on the lesion. You'll see here what was happening is the uh, LAD wire because the force is coming back into the LED and moving to and fro. And uh, at this point in time also, the guiding catheter was coming out, the rotor floppy wire was being pulled back with the sustained pressure on the lesion. And uh, in, this is the time when he started having chest bone and hypotension. An echocardiogram was done and a few check shots were done to make sure that there was no perforation or no uh, dissection. And at this point in time, the rotablator was uh, abandoned. The lesion was then recrossed with a whisper wire, which was again unsuccessful. A Sion blue went through. Serial dilatations were done with a 1.252 and then with a 2.5 OPN balloon, and then stented with a 3 to 15 regulating stent, and then followed by a 3 millimeter OPN balloon to 30 atmospheres. Now, this was, of course, the initial balloon dilatations with 1.25. Two and then a 2.5 high, high pressure dilatation. And then the lesion was stented with a dilating stent and post dilatation with a, this is the stent. And then it was post dilated with that high pressure with a OPN balloon. And this was the final result obtained. And uh, this was one of the cases where rotablator was unsuccessful and uh, we had to treat the lesion with serial balloon dilatations and OPN balloon came to our rescue. And this was the, of course, the final result. Now, the key points here were, of course, one was a severely angulated LED ostium, severe calcification, probably more than a 300 degree arc. The risk of perforation thought was very high when the rotablator burr would not pass and he had severe chest pain. The question here is whether a 1.25 burr may have been a better choice to begin with and then use a step burr approach. Here, of course, there was a cost consideration because he was a very poor patient and uh, even this rotablator burr was given, done free, uh, free of cost as a complementary because he had so much pain. Now, other possibility here is whether after doing an initial uh, balloon dilatation with a 1.25 balloon, whether a 1.5 burr should have been retried after the initial balloon dilatation. I've seen some people doing that as well. IVL, of course, this was done much before we started doing IVL and of course, and the affordability was a major concern. When this particular case of failed rot ablation, OPN came to a rescue. And another last thing that was in my mind for discussion was whether when you are stenting this, whether the stent should have been come from the LAD to the left main and use a provisional strategy for the Ramus intermediate uh, calcific lesion. So these are the other things that were in my mind, but uh, to keep it simple, this is what it was done. And since we could, I could not debulk the lesion, I was not very comfortable stenting it across the LAD into the left main. In case the proximal LAD is under expanded and with the risk of restenosis or stent thrombosis, I, didn't want, I did not want to risk going into the the region coming to the left main and causing left main occlusion as well. So this was one case where uh, we failed with a rotablator and OPN balloon came to a rescue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arun, uh, for showing this uh, interesting case. The, basically, the problem was uh, because of angulation, I think. The rotor exactly, was not yeah, exactly, yeah. Extreme severe angulation. Uh -huh. So if any of the other seniors have any, any other suggestion, what else could have been done apart from the things that I have listed here. I would like to get your feedback. Yeah, what what you, what you did is a good alternative. Basically, after the stenting, it didn't look like it's too much under-expansion or anything. The lesion was preparation with your open balloon looked all right, and that's how the stent expanded well. But if you analyze the angiogram carefully, I think uh, 
though in ap cordal it was looking right from ostium elevo cordal you could have a small stump there that's where you could land the stent and uh, that's how ramus didn't have any pinching in spite of you positioning because there is some common area of uh, running of both uh, led and uh, ramus together it looks like in ap cordal but in elevo cordal it could have got separated that's how you got but many of the gradual consensus what is going on uh, in the now uh, is uh, many of the times the plaque extends to so distal left main and people tend to exactly, cover exactly, from left exactly. main to yes, led yes. but you said you mentioned some reasons but we are always very uncomfortable in co in co covering the entire lcx and big ramuses unless you are absolutely it is required so what you did result came out all right manoj says well, i can't uh, chatted saying that why can't you patient this patient for surgery he does more complicated cases with all pcis but he's suggesting to uh, you to send for surgery for ostial just in a lighter way i'm telling manoj anyway that is not the point of discussion he wanted to show ostial led tackling with yes, the pcis that was offered showed. to him yeah cbg was offered to him and as i mentioned initially he was very skeptical of the no, 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 i don't CBG think because... i don't think we need to <laughs> apologetic uh, sinwas now today's today's era I don't think yeah. uh, we need to be so much uh, explaining not sending for CABG in that sort of cases. <laughs> It is fully acceptable if you are doing a good result. If you are if you are uh, having a problem there, we can't uh, the LCX gets into trouble. Things like that is different. Exactly. But otherwise, exactly. the final result exactly. is uh, quite good. And if there's uh, any comments from our my co-chairs, otherwise we will move on. So Bali sir, and, uh, second, anything? I think uh, uh, Vijay is pushing for the second case. But I just have uh, some comment to make. I, I'm sure Dr. Srinivas has done. Uh, no, numerous uh, rotablation, but the impression I got here was, you know, you had to be a little gentle and give the rotablator uh, bar some time to ablate. I think uh, we got, I got an impression that the movement of that bar was uh, too quick to give you an um, uh, do actual ablation at the ostium side. But I, I think. Uh, so Yeah, no, sir. This was just one or two. Yeah, one or two pictures which I had there. Initially, we tried with the minimum contact and pecking motion. At the end, I only showed you that we even tried putting a lot of uh, pressure to see whether it would go through. So, this, since it did not, and there was a lot of the guiding catheter and the guide wire backing out, and patient had hemodynamic compromise. That is when I had to give up. Now, what Sir is suggesting is there no point repeating the same technique four or five times if it's not working. It doesn't work. Huh? you try some alternative otherwise uh, go for the next thing that's what you did in the end later after trying five times the patient landed in trouble with hypotension you could have done it even before anyway we'll move on to the next case vijay yes sir so the we have a next presentation by dr arshad uh, dr arshad is a uh, senior uh, interventional cardiologist mm -hmm. and director of sk hospital trivandrum so i'd like to request dr arshad to uh, present your case sir. Sir, uh, your mic is on mute, sir. Now, now it's audible, right? Yes, sir. Audible, sir. Audible, sir. Over to you, sir. Good evening, senior faculty, and good evening, uh, all the um, people who are listening to this. And uh, thank you, Translumina, for this opportunity. And uh, my case is about an unyielding pinhole in a tortuous right coronary artery, and uh, this is given a tough time in our capilla ones, and. Uh, This is about a uh, short story about the patient, a 65-year-old male who is diagnosed with chronic IHD since years, and uh, he, uh, his hypertensive history, coronary angiography was done 10 years back. CAD was detected that time, and he was advised medical management, but details of which could not be obtained. Admitted with worsening angina, and he was having positive cardiac markers, echo showing regional wall motion involving the multiple territories. Ejection fraction was 40 percentage. Coronary angiography done through the right radial root revealed major lesions were an LAD D1 bifurcation lesion critical. LCX after the major OM is small and is hundred percentage and uh, a, uh, a small OM is coming. A OM2 is coming after that uh, uh, CTO and RCA showing a tight pinhole RCA lesion in the midpoint and there is another. tubular lesion in the proximal portion he was advised uh, coronary artery bypass surgery but he was uh, for a multivessel ptca he preferred ptca this was his left system as shown uh, there's a led d1 critical bifurcation lesion the both the branches were involved medina 111 and rc as said there's a uh, this is what a peculiar origin the catheter is just floating 
uh, in the uh, slight posterior origin and the slight upward going RCA and this is a 70 percent tubular lesion in the proximal area. The major culprit was a tight uh, pinhole at the uh, mid RCA across the torticity and the, uh, just after the lesion in fact the, uh, the vessel is taking a 270 degree course and which is followed by another torticity down again and then again another torticity distally and finally coming towards the uh, PLV distal branches. And this LVT D1 uh, was uh, uh, we did through a DK crush technique and with a 3 by 40 LED stand and a 2.5 to 32 drug eluting stand in the D1 and we got a fairly good result with this and a right radial route. And in the same sitting only we tried with a uh, PTCA to RCA and it is, this is the JR catheter which is just floating onto the ostium of the RCA. We are, sure, we are sure that in fact it's not going to give us good support for a procedure because we know that this is going to be a tough lesion at the end. And so what, what we did was we used a six of uh, AL1, AL2 catheter. The iota was little dilated, and uh, the catheter, the, the 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 catheter was just sitting at the ostium of the RCA, and uh, uh, deep intubation was not much possible because there was a proximal lesion also. It was giving some damping. And uh, we used a uh, guideliner at this moment. And with that, in fact, we could negotiate a 1.5 balloon through that. We tried to dilate the lesion uh, with the 1.5 long balloon. And uh, we can go, we can see this dog burning effect with this 1.5 balloon. And finally, as you increase the inflation pressure, it finally got ruptured. And at this point, we thought that this lesion will give you more trouble than uh, expected. And we thought we have to stay the procedure and we have been taken for the procedure uh, on uh, after two days. And uh, here we used a right femoral route, again a 6 of L2 catheter. The, see the pinhole, uh, which is almost the same without, uh, uh, without having any change in morphology. And uh, this time we used an anchoring balloon for the proper uh, uh, support of the balloon because no balloons were going again. And uh, so we used an anchoring balloon technique. And with that, we used, we have uh, passed a 1.5 long balloon again. And again, this balloon got ruptured. So we know that, uh, in fact, this, so any other mode of uh, plaque modification is necessary. And we thought, in fact, a rotablation would be a good thing. But the problem is, in fact, the passing the rota wire. It's a known uh, torque wire. We know that. And uh, uh, by uh, we could uh, uh, we tried to pass a microcatheter wire through the microcatheter through the coronary wire, but we couldn't. And but even with the uh, anchoring balloon, the catheter was not traversing through that uh, pinhole. So what we did was, in fact, by keeping the microcatheter at the mouth of the pinhole, we tried to pass the rota wire, but still it was the the, the thing was not very easy. In fact, uh, the, 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 the 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 wire has to take multiple turns down. This was not a very good uh, uh, torqueable wire. And still, we thought that in fact we can we really decently negotiate the wire to the distal areas after the two uh, curves and uh, the distal curve it could not be negotiated. And with that, in fact, we started rotablating with a one lakh sixty thousand um, uh, uh, bar speed uh, and uh, around for multiple times with a one point five bar. We have been a little worried that in fact every time when you are touching the lesion, your catheter is not giving full support. In fact, catheter is just backing out. Slate, uh, uh, the entire system is slightly backing out, but but uh, this uh, time we are comfortable. But towards the end, towards the end of the rotablation, in fact, we found that in fact it was giving a little panic. That in fact the wire was coming out a little bit, so that the rota bar was touching the. Uh, the floppy portion of the rota wire at once. And this has given a little bit of panic, but what our job has been done. In fact, the, the rota bar has crossed the lesion once, and we have got a decent res result after this. So this time we used a pre-dilatation with a 2 by 10 region balloon, which is followed by a 3.5 ton suffered to MC, but uh, still the dog bone is still persisting. We are then uh, uh, we uh, removed the balloon and we used a 3 by 10 uh, opian balloon at this moment and which was uh, went up to 35 atmospheric pressure and it is opened up and uh, then the procedure was simple but we st st completed the procedure with the two drug eluting stent 
3.515 in the mid RCA and 3.518 uh, uh, drug eluting stent in the proximal RCA, and the necessary post dilatations were done. This is the final result which we obtained. So present case highlighted the use of uh, supporting catheters, anchoring balloon, rotablation in a calcific and yielding lesion, and it also highlighted the use of opium balloon inflation at a higher pressure for opening up such lesion. Thank you for the patient listening. Thank you, for Arshad, for showing this case. And uh, there are many points to be learned in such cases of tortuous RCA. And But if you analyze and see what is the cause here, a slightly anomalous origin and upgoing RCA, and uh, with the borderline lesion there and another critical lesion in the mid RCA, those are the combination of things which are creating trouble. Many times, uh, to keep the procedure simple in such sort of things, uh, we got away by using the five French radial, which actually gives less support, but it goes through that proximal milder lesion. Uh, the Take the five French catheter, get it deeper, just proximal to lesion. And many of the times, because the calcification didn't look much here, so as to require rotablation and things like that. The problem here is basically of support because artery is upgoing and there's a lesion there. Though you used amplads, amplads was not supporting like amplads because never went deep in. Hawkins TPR catheter or the five French catheter, which can go deep in spite of the proximal mild lesion, would have tackled this easily. And many of the times we got away just with five French catheter with regular balloon dilatations and uh, stent because once uh, you had a uh, so, so support was a main issue here along with the tartuous. That's what I felt rather than the calcium at the lesion. Uh, there could be a combination of things also, but uh, that is another way to do the procedure simple. As we know, especially when you have a proximal lesion in the RCA, we always tend to avoid taking amplads because it tends to get dissected, especially when it, then there's a lesion proximally. So if you can do by any other measures, uh, what, what I suggested, to always explore those before we going into this combination. But finally, fortunately, everything went well and the final result was quite good. Uh, over to you, sir. Bali, sir, and Arun or Ajayan, anything? Great case, sir. Arun? Arun no, sir? I think that's fine. Uh, we can okay. move ahead. Uh, I think we have... Other learnings, I think uh, you've already mentioned mm. and they are well okay. taken. I think we'll go to the next case, Vijay, because yes, we are all... So, uh, the next to request Dr. Samantha Shekhar Padi to present his presentation. Uh, he's the last part one today? Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we so have very so good remembrances so with Dr. Samantha. We worked together in the earlier hospital. He was trained with us here. And then uh, both pediatrics now into adult. I think he's doing more and more good work. Over to you. Sir, Father Gulwad. And, uh, uh, sorry, my uh, audio is, sorry, video is not helping us much today. But I think I'll be able to present my case. And uh, we are not seeing your slides yet, Suman. So your presentation is not visible. Uh, yeah, it's coming up. Now, now. Yeah, now it is coming. Yes, sir. And uh, from the outset, I uh, thank all the uh, moderators and uh, panelists for giving me the opportunity. This is a case uh, recently done. Uh, this is a 38 year old gentleman, uh, poorly controlled diabetic had a severe uh, COVID pneumonia, uh, admitted to the local hospital on uh, 3rd of uh, May. Then uh, had uh, antral MI on the 12th, received our hospital the, uh, after 24 hours, uh, uh, the out of window period, and at the time of admission, he didn't have any angina. He was managed conservatively, was uh, COVID negative on 20th, but uh, remained persistently on uh, oxygen for uh, more than 25 days with vaccine and winning course was shifted in and out of the uh, high dependency unit twice uh, for desaturation. Shifted to cardiac ICU with a mask with 8 liter of oxygen, but could not be weaned up from oxygen. Antipro BNP remained uh, in the range of around uh, four, three to 4,000. ECO shows uh, apical uh, and distal antral dyskinesia, and uh, EF was around 45%. This was his last second CT uh, before shifting him out of the ICU, COVID ICU. As you can see, the score was around 20 by 25. Uh, the lungs is extensively damaged. Because of uh, his persistent uh, oxygen dependency, we thought let us shoot the uh, coronary and see what is happening. As you can see, this uh, RC was uh, significantly diseased, uh, proximally. And uh, you can see the LED. Uh, is heavily calcified, uh, especially at the uh, at the site of the LMC bifurcation, and uh, it is diseased from the ostium till the uh, distal segment. 
LCX osteum is relatively uh, disease free and LCX uh, uh, one of the OM is disease but uh, I think uh, that was an acceptable uh, uh, thing. So this is his uh, uh, angiography. Uh, then we uh, had a discussion uh, in our team uh, what next to be done because there are multiple issues are there. One uh, the what uh, what, what, the way it is it has to be tackled. Ideally, the patient should have gone for a CABG, but uh, is out of uh, question because of obvious reason. So the for multivessel PCA the issues were uh, heavily calcified LED need some kind of uh, plat modification. Distal LMC is also involved, so provisional uh, uh, versus two stand strategy was uh, thought, but since the LCX osteum was not involved, we thought that we will plan for a provisional crossover from LMC to LED. And what should be the sequence of the PCI? Now for plaque modification, uh, uh, the choice should have been uh, Ruta, but uh, there are two, three issues were there. The, the uh, mid to distal LED also was involved, which was not of a larger size. So probably 1.25 bar uh, followed by 1.5 bar would have been used. Uh, another uh, fearsome issue was that uh, slow flow because patient had recently uh, had an MI. We thought there may be uh, some uh, slow flow or no free flow can happen. And uh, we may have land in uh, problem in this particular case. Again, uh, there, there is some uh, theoretical chance of that L6 uh, uh, osteo might get damaged because uh, the LED osteo at the origin uh, at the, uh, from LMC was heavily calcified. So some uh, flow uh, disturbances in the L6 may cause uh, further problem to us. Uh, so second choice was IVL. Then what should be the size because of uh, resources uh, limitation? We cannot use two balloon. The distal uh, size was around 2.5 uh, proximal and uh, proximal LED and LMC was around uh, 3 3.5. Uh, then uh, uh, imaging must has to be done. So we thought of uh, doing the RCA first. But uh, uh, the particular another issue is what uh, anticoagulation or antiplatelet has to be given. No, uh, he was on oral anticoagulant for almost 15-20 uh, days. Uh, his uh, D-dimer was in uh, uh, downward trend, so we stopped uh, uh, the oral uh, ant anticoagulant, loaded with uh, ticagliner, and we took the patient uh, for uh, PTC after two days of the angiography. The LED uh, RC was uh, simple. Uh, it was dilated and uh, stented with 2.5 into 34 DS and post dilated with uh, 2.75. The mid, uh, mid LED was uh, dilated with uh, uh, 2 uh, millimeter uh, balloon and IUS was uh, run was taken. I'm not going to show this thing uh, completely, but as you can see, there is a significant uh, fibro fatty and there is a calcium here also in the almost of uh, 180 degree and furthermore to our more closest to uh, proximal LED almost 270 degree calcium was there which was not visible in the fluoro uh, nicely. You can see the significant uh, calcium burden here in the LED osteum. You can see the calcium burden in the uh, osteum also. So uh, the proximal LED was uh, uh, and IVL uh, was given uh, at four atmosphere. Uh, Ten pulses were given. Uh, at this stage, uh, stage, the patient had significant fall in uh, BP and uh, need, needs uh, uh, inotropic support to be started. So we changed our strategy. Subsequent uh, pulses was given at uh, five pulses. Uh, at multiple time instead of uh, ten pulses, we uh, decrease the pulses. Uh, rate uh, but we uh, increase the frequency and the osteal uh, led we gave uh, at uh, five pulses each uh, at six at atmosphere at multiple site multiple time uh, post ivl just uh, took an uh, three millimeter balloon just to interrogate whether the uh, balloon expansion is proper or not and subsequently uh, the uh, mid distal led was uh, stented with uh, 2.7 2.5 uh, into 48 uh, 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 expedition and subsequently it was uh, post dilated up to 2.75 and uh, 3 millimeter 
the costume of the LMC was uh, directed with uh, 3.5 and uh, this 3.5 into 33 expedition was deployed at uh, it will be under pressure at eight atmosphere so that the distal age the distal diameter was 3.3 uh, uh, and subsequently it was uh, post dilated with 3.5 4 and uh, the lmc was uh, dilated with 4.5 millimeter uh, balloon and uh, post ivs we had a uh, ivs run also that showed a uh, good opposition of the stent. I'm not going to show the detail of uh, this thing, but uh, the stent opposition was uh, good throughout. And we had a good uh, angiographic result after the procedure also. Uh, there was some uh, sign of pinching of uh, L6 was there, but uh, IUS uh, didn't show any uh, significant lesion there. Post uh, procedure after 48 hour, the patient was off uh, oxygen, was ambulated and could be discharged uh, with uh, respiratory uh, therapy, uh, physiotherapy and respiratory exercise on uh, fifth day of the procedure. The take home message is uh, high risk patients needs proper planning and education of the procedure as a marginal error is minimal and we do not have any plan uh, B, particularly in this case. IVL is a great help in calcified disease with low or no complications. Intracoronary imaging adds on to the planning and edu education. Thank you. Thank you, Shubman, for showing the excellent case. Actually, the, the initial pictures didn't look like it would grow so much. A lot of it was total occlusion and uh, spasm in the vessels along with the disease, I think. That's how it opened up. You, you mentioned a point that uh, increased pulses uh, were leading to some problems, or less pulses, but I couldn't get it. But basically, it was more like a long occlusion of the vessel, perhaps producing yes. ischemia, causing hemodynamic yes. changes rather than the pulses, I think. What do you feel? Yes, sir. Because, because after inflation at four atmosphere, the LED was totally occluded. Yeah, that so was causing of, trouble. So we, when we gave 10 uh, pulses, the time was more, sir. So it was producing ischemia and hypotension. So yeah, what that we was the reason, five anything, pulses. Anything, uh, anything described regarding the pulses, I'm not aware. I'm asking. Uh, long pulses, uh, if you give us short pulses, I think more of ischemic That's what is happening. But final uh, result looked quite good. Both RCA and LED looked all right. And LCX, it is better not to do anything unless if it is absolutely essential. Because you fiddle around with LCX ostium, you land in trouble again. LCX ostium is always difficult to manage. Unless it is absolutely essential, don't do anything to LCX ostium. I think uh, this is 38 year old male. Huh? Yes, you said 38. Yes, it is a 38 year old male with a diabetic uh, which was not recognized. HB1AC was more than 10 at the time of admission. Somehow, uh, we find a lot of uh, calcium, coronary calcium in this area of uh, central India. Uh, we don't know, probably some environmental cause is there. Even at 40, 45, 30 years of age, there are significant calcium we see in uh, these areas of uh, patients. Yeah, diabetes, diabetic disease, sometimes you do have diffuse disease calcification. And but yes. fortunately, RCA was reasonably big vessel and looked all right and it improved quite well after the procedure. The COVID yes. uh, pneumonia is supposed to be worsening, COVID infection is supposed to be worsening diabetes. And many patients uh, presented with diabetic ketosis doses and uh, unless it was managed well, they were succumbing because of diabetes also. That also is noted. I think uh, for now patient overall will improve better with ischemia part is taken care. I think Correct. he should be doing well. That's how he was discharged immediately. Without this, I don't think... After five days, yes, sir. After yeah, five days, the procedure will discharge the patients. Yeah. I think a good job done. Uh, sir, uh, any Thank comments you. from you both? I think wonderfully done, Casey. Uh, LED didn't look that it will open up yeah. that as it finally did. So I think uh, IVL does work in such cases. And uh, more importantly, imaging is of great, great value. In such cases where we have diffuse disease, to see what is the optimum diameter of the vessel. Very well done, yes. Thank you, sir. For sake of listeners, sir, uh, you have any tips? Many of the times when you started doing these IVLs, we are noticing IVL balloon ruptures. Okay, later on we discussed with the company also, they said they're coming with a two-layered uh, uh, IVL balloon to, to prevent such less ruptures happening. Um, but you have any particular tips to prevent such? I think, uh, first of all, uh, I pre-dilated with another balloon and uh, see if, uh, maybe a two-millimeter balloon or something because it's a bulky balloon. And uh, other than that, I also have faced this problem of, um, you know, balloon rupturing. And uh, 
I'm told it has something to do with the pulse uh, length or whatever, and the positioning of the balloon at the site of the culture. But I, I have not been able to master that as yet. Uh, we have done about eight, eight courses or so. Uh, so I think uh, they need to work more on the balloon. And uh, maybe if you have more tips, that could help uh, everybody. Yeah, basically, unless you prepare it with a 2mm balloon, it won't go only. That is must only. Without, without dilatation, the balloon also will not track there and go there. But what is uh, generally said is a proper uh, pre-dilatation or preparation of the balloon with, uh, not, with no air being there and uh, flushing it with saline properly. That is helpful. If the air is there, again, it could land in, produce more such problems. Other thing is while well, deflating, once you deflate it and uh, once uh, the green button, there's a check on the uh, console, Unless the green thing goes, uh, never uh, totally come out of the balloon. If you, if uh, that before that happens, if you do it, it's supposed to cause an approximation and uh, more balloon ruptures. That's what I was told. But we need to learn more. Though. Some of the things I think we are all learning. Once we have also noticed the calcium spicule, uh, sometimes we have what we see with NC balloons could happen with this also. At that particular point, uh, calcium spicule or could also injure uh, this balloon. So it also depends upon what sort of calcification we are dealing with. But I think company is coming up with two-layered balloon, I was told. I think Vijay can confirm that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So it was uh, supposed to come in April, but because of uh, this COVID uh, delay, uh, the next delivery will be coming to us now in June. And so please don't decrease the cost further, okay? Already it is no, too no, much. <laughs> <Just to remain. laughs> so the cost oh, okay. will remain the same for, for some more time uh, because uh, we are also renegotiating uh, with them uh, to bring down the cost uh, for, uh, for Indian patients. Uh, and uh, we are also trying to uh, get it into uh, the panels of CGHS and other uh, panels also. So that work also is simultaneously going on. Unfortunately, the second wave has delayed a lot of things. The approval uh, for this new balloon had got delayed because we were not knowing that we need to get a separate approval for this double layer. Uh, uh, that got delayed. And then uh, now the other delay is uh, CGHS approval uh, for final approval for this. So. Uh, we are working on it sir, so that more and more patients will get benefit uh, of these new technologies. Uh, I'm personally following up for Impala as well uh, for the CGHS and uh, some of the uh, GST. Uh, uh, maybe if it is uh, removed, then even Impala can be uh, very, uh, very reasonably uh, pricing because it is almost 15% of, of uh, the import duty and then again 12% GST. So we are paying almost 27% of the cost to the to the government uh, for these new new technologies to bring into India. So these technologies can be 27% cheaper if the government also understands that uh, these technologies are for the uh, good or for the better. Uh... Dr. Srinivasan, the problem is once a device gets approved by FDA and the insurance yes. starts paying in US, then the prices don't come. <laughs> If you remember in Bella when it initially it came in India, uh, it was very cheap, yeah. yes, sir. affordable. And then FDA approved it and we lost Impella. Same thing is now going to happen to lithotripsy. So I don't see prices dropping anytime soon. But this should be competitive to rotabulation, sir, actually. As on the behalf of interventional community and for the sake of benefit, what I request Translumna is should make it competitive to the rotabulation, which is a less... Uh, technically challenging. So obviously more people would adapt. I wouldn't have bothered if the technology doesn't work. So it helps the patients really. If it is uh, not uh, very usable and doesn't work, we are not bothered whether it is too costly or too clear, less. But it's a useful technology. If the cost is less, it can be adapted for more patients. Yeah. Agree is with there you. any chance of getting volume, it in a longer length? The uh, is there the any price chance? Drop, volume will go very, very high. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And uh, is there any chance of getting this balloon in longer length? The length of 12 millimeter is actually too short. And that's why the problem often comes up that uh, in most cases, uh, one balloon is not enough. <laughs> but 80 <laughs> pulses, no, sir. 80 pulses, you can keep repeating. If it becomes more longer, also sometimes it could be challenging delivering the balloon. Uh, that's also so, a thing. So we do have because of 80 balloons, pulses, we can use it. In Multi to you, Vijay. So we do have uh, the peripheral balloons, which are slightly longer uh, than the coronary balloon. But for coronary balloon, uh, since the, the distance between both the emitters is, is fixed, and uh, the moment they increase the, the distance between the emitters, the impact becomes lesser. 
so it, there is some sort of engineering challenges they they are facing in increasing the length of the balloon of a uh, coronary balloon but for uh, peripheral balloon they have beautifully done it with 40 mm and 60 mm length but in that case the number of emitters are more if you look at the number of emitters in peripheral balloon they are more in coronary they cannot add more emitter because uh, that will uh, impact the size and the profile of the balloon it is already a bulky balloon so there are some sort of uh, engineering challenges to increase the length of the balloon otherwise this company is uh, quite good enough to uh, do r and d uh, at, at the faster pace than than other companies and i last one year one and a half year now i'm with them uh, indirectly working with them uh, through transformina but there is lot of interaction happen with their international uh, experts on uh, on all the, the uh, things we shared with them so the first one was the double layer then now they are coming up with the double layer balloon so that it have less ruptures now the our request was then to increase the number of pulses in coronary mm -hmm. balloon so that is another work they are going on uh, because sometimes 80 pulses are not good enough to dilate uh, heavily calcified lesions and then uh, the cost adds on to another cost of ivl is is another burden to the patient uh, which adds 3 and 3 and half lakh rupees for the patient so so um, uh, i think this is a very good inter interaction we had today i would like to thank on behalf of transdomina and my entire marketing team who uh, beautifully uh, managed to uh, do this 3 day uh, extravaganza of uh, intervention cases uh, through this bic series 2 So on behalf of France Lumina, I'd like to thank Dr. Bali, uh, Dr. Ashke Bali. Thank you so much, sir, for chairing this session. And Dr. Arun Chopra, thank you so much, sir, for uh, chairing this session. Uh, Dr. Shinivas, uh, being a moderator and patiently moderating this for more than two, uh, I think almost three hours, sir. So it is five o'clock. So almost three hours session we have. And I would like to request Dr. S. S. Pari, Dr. Arshad, Dr. Shalendra Trivedi. and our panelist dr uh, samba sivam dr m shrinivas dr kamal kamaldeep chawla dr vimal mehta and dr uh, mohit gupta uh, i'm sure uh, they would have uh, been stayed with us till the end uh, but yes sir, it was a great learning uh, experience for me sir from all of you experts uh, in my career whatever i am it is just because of the standing beside you in some of the cases earlier i was uh promoting laser for philips uh now move to this uh, shockwave and impella so uh, thank you so much for teaching me also uh, uh, all these expert uh, uh, things uh, and we do use uh, your comments in our communication uh, whenever we meet uh, the upcoming doctors or the doctors who wants uh, some expert comments uh, from us so uh, from bottom of my heart sir uh, i i feel a thrill today Uh, with the with this type of discussion happen and the way uh, us senior sir dr bali dr shrinivas and dr arun chopra you motivated all the presenters uh, uh, with your expert comments so that is what i really felt good in in this session uh, thank you so much once again sir uh, sir any last uh, uh, departing comments uh, from dr arun chopra dr hk bali dr shrinivas and dr bali i think dr shrinivas and what the uh, But I don't want to say something. No, no. I was just saying um, thanks to BIC and to Translumina for having this meeting and uh, having us uh, be part of this session. It was very interesting uh, and gives uh, an opportunity to meet uh, old friends and old seniors teachers like Dr. Bali, Dr. Jain was. So great uh, opportunity. Uh, thanks a lot and uh, keep up uh, the good work. Thank you. You were saying something, sir. So I just said, yeah, but Dr. Sinwasan did a wonderful job, and mm -hmm. I he patiently uh, listened to everybody, and uh, his moderation was absolutely excellent. One of the cases which I will remember is what was done by Dr. Ravi, I think, from uh, Chennai. Uh, the, the case where there was a uh, 86-year-old doctor. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a very interesting case, and I think um, he deserves special mention. Conclusion. Yeah. Dr. Sinwasan, over to you. Uh, Dr. Manoj. Of uh, Chennai, he presented the doctor flash problem already. Yes. All the cases were uh, quite good, and lot of learning points from each of case. And uh, though it is not complex or simple, but we could learn some points from each of the case. And uh, thanks, uh, uh, Transumna and BIC for making this possible for us. And thanks for involving. Oh, thank you. Take leave. Thank you so much, thank sir. You. Have a nice evening, sir. Thank have you. a nice evening to all of you. Uh,
and thank you so much for uh, for your uh, for treating patients even during COVID uh, nineteen uh, restrictions. So as as a company, uh, we salute you for your uh, for your work and for your excellent work. Not work; it is excellent work and your dedication towards uh, the medical uh, community. Thank you thank so you. much.